take seat. Apologies for being the potty pooper here, but we got to start at some point in time. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Thai Toronto's Summer Collision Mixer. Like the best way to end the collision um, chaos after all, uh, we have a special summer mixer this time with Thai Toronto. And once everybody settles in, we're going to start. All right, so I'm your host for the evening. I'm Neha Behel, one of the executive advisors and charter members for Thai Toronto. And I'm also a general partner at Renew VC in the, in, as a US fund, as an impact fund. And I will be your host for tonight. Welcome everybody. And we're gonna start off with a welcome message from the president of Thai Toronto, Vijay Thomas. Thank you very much, Neha, and uh, welcome everybody. So what do we need to do to get everybody in? Please, uh, we got a lot of seats here. Please help yourselves to some seats, um, and, 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 and uh, uh, we're ready to get started. Are we, are we, I'm going to call out names now. <laughs> Hiten. Um, as a leading light of the VC industry, venture capital industry in Ontario, we'd like you to lead the way and please find a seat, okay? And if you then find a seat, everybody else should as well. So thank you. Okay. Sorry, Hiten. So, <laughs> so welcome, welcome again. Uh, this is, today is a uh, collision. I, I've heard there's lots of parties happening and all of you took the time to be at this one. So we obviously know this is the best one, but the fact that you knew that this was the best one as well really makes us feel good. So thank you very much for coming here. Uh, and even what makes the party, it, it, is, it is all of us make the party and all of us, uh, there's two reasons we come here today. One is to, to celebrate, uh, you know, summer, celebrate, this is a mixer that we have every summer. Uh, we have it on the, um, uh, on the back of collision, so it is. It brings people from all over the world, and I've been, I've been, I've been uh, uh, speaking to a lot of people in the audience. Uh, some of you, how many of you are from outside of uh, Toronto? Don't raise your hands. A lot of you. So welcome everybody that's outside of Toronto. Really good to have you here, and the rest of you, welcome. How many of you are from outside of Canada? Okay, welcome again. Everybody has come out from outside Canada. You know. Uh, one of our, um, uh, you know, uh, Itesh, thank you very much. You, you made it all the way from India. Uh, there's, I think, a few more people. Thai, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, where's the gentleman from Andhra Pradesh? Uh, um, so I think a lot of people from lots of parts of the world here. So we really thank all of you that have made it today. And it's going to be a great, great evening. We'll start off with Thai women's uh, global pitch competition. 
Some of you might uh, know that this is a, a premier event for us, but more than anything else, how many of you were at Collision? So we've got um, five teams, four teams. Um, yeah, four teams. Out of the four teams, three teams were winners at Collision. Okay, so obviously we're doing something right. Um, Upasana and team, we're doing something right. We've chosen the right teams. Right? And without knowing anything, we chose teams that have won at Collision. So congratulations to all of you. All those teams that are going to be here, you're already winners. And I think some of you are, are going to win more today. And we, we wish you all the best. Um, a little bit about Thai. Um, a lot of you already know about Thai. Uh, but if you don't, uh, we're around 3,000 chartered members worldwide. One trillion USD in wealth created. And I think there's a gentleman here from Thai Silicon Valley. Uh, Mr. Reddy, is he here? Oh yeah, Mr. Reddy, right in front here. So Silicon Valley is where this all started. This is where the magic started, and 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 uh, Silicon Valley today is still, you know, one of our most uh, successful chapters. You know, we were there uh, earlier last uh, month, and and uh, some of you that win Thai competitions, you end up at Thai Silicon Valley Thaicon Silicon Valley, and uh, some of you um, have uh, that have participated. You get to meet the Drapers, you get to meet the whole Thai ecosystem. So it's fantastic. So we're not just in Toronto, but we're also globally, and, and also markets that uh, today a lot of startups want to go after. Growth markets like India is where Thai has a lot of chapters as well. So definitely something to, to, to keep in mind. 62 locations, okay, well, I think you guys got that part, yeah. The Thai Toronto are foundational principles, mentoring, investment, networking, incubation, and education. So today, we're gonna to do a couple of these things. There's, there's mentoring, obviously, that we will, we will get to all the startups. Networking, part of what we're doing here, uh, investment, incubation, and, and education is something that uh, we will talk about in a little more detail. Next. Okay, what do we do in Toronto? And, and how many of you is the first time attending a Thai Toronto event? Okay, so, you know, Fanta, thank you very much. So we have events almost every month. So TyQuest, we have an acceleration program. This is one of uh, the, uh, the premier uh, acceleration programs in Canada. We also tie that in with our number two, our uh, scale-up startup incubation program. So if, if you need, if you know friends from around the world that want to come to Canada, want to set up a business here, uh, we have a startup visa program as well. So Upasana, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear from us soon, but she heads that program for us. The Thai Toronto Open Mic Night. So this is something that we have every month. So basically it's startups that come in, you've got an open mic, you can ask your questions, you can pitch, uh, you can talk about problems that you might be having at your startup. You could be an angel investor, you could be a venture capital. So it's, it's, it's generally a fun evening. And uh, we welcome everybody. And if you want to become Thai Toronto members, come to a Thai open mic night, and, and you can get a flavor of what we do, and then you can decide to join or not. Thai University Challenge is, again, very similar to the Thai Accelerator Program, but for university. And the Thai Women Challenge, and that's something that we're doing today. Um, so, so you would uh, um, know more of that. So it is, we're very strong on women. We're very strong on, on global. And um, thank you again, everybody. I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to Pasna. Pasna is going to take you through a, a lot more of what we do. Pasna, let's give a round of applause, guys. Thank you so much, Vijay, for introducing Thai to everyone. But first of all, we are what we are. We do what we do because we have community like you who come after being busy with the conference for three days, you still are here, it means oh, a lot to you. So a big round of applause for all of you who have joined us today evening in one spirit, which is to foster entrepreneurship. Uh, as we just said, Thai is a global organization. We have around 66 chapters around 14 countries in the world. Every chapter works on four pillars. One is education, mentoring, access to funding, incubation, and networking. So what you're doing over here is networking. And if you need anything further, we are here to provide you. I'm not gonna go further about Thai more. I'm just gonna bring to light one quick thing. 
Thai Global, the global organization which sits in Silicon Valley, and Ram can give you a full lecture on it, how it works, Ram ready, is host a global conference every year. It's called Thai Global Summit. So tonight, we want to take you through the teaser of the Thai Global Summit, which is happening in Bangalore this year. Last successful Thai Global Summits took place in Dubai, Singapore, Hyderabad, and now this time it is happening in Bangalore. Just to give you a little bit of idea. Can anyone make a wild guess? The slide has actually passed through. How many delegates they're expecting in Thai Bangalore? 25,000. It's going to be the biggest celebration of entrepreneurship ever. And team in India, they have a massive support from the federal government and the Karnataka government to put this together. Just to give you an idea, we have people, we will have visionaries, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, investors, startup founders from over 14 countries coming to India for Thai Global Summit in December 2014. It's scheduled from December 9th to 12th. And what you will be getting there is networking, try to forge relationship, have transformative decision made for your startups and for your investments, get to know the no trends. It's working with one motive there only entrepreneurship first. And not only today, the judges, today one of your winners will be going to with us to India on an all paid trip to compete in the Thai global women pitch competition where there'll be 67 participants from 67 different countries. So please make sure you send with us the best of Toronto has to offer. Okay. I will push you the slides just to give you an idea how big this Thai global conferences are and the kind of keynote speakers they have attracted in the past. We have Elon Musk, who has been a keynote speaker. We have had Satya Nadella. We have had Sundar Pichai. We have had Indra Nui and other big names who usually come as keynote speakers. We are waiting for Bangalore to unravel. They've already invited Jason Huang from NVIDIA to come. Let's see if he's accepting the invitation, but it's going to be a big conference. I think the Thai Bangalore team does it better to sell it. They have a video for you. Quickly, we'll go through the video to see what their vision is for this conference. Please go ahead. TJS 2024 is just not another event. It is a movement to unleash the boundless potential of human enterprise. Imagine all of us coming together to co-create the Olympics of entrepreneurship. 25,000 plus participants lighting up the world with the power of enterprise. Putting entrepreneurship first means to advocate the power of entrepreneurship as the primary driver of economic growth and social progress with various governments and other policy makers and also to promote it as the first choice of career for all of our youth. your tickets now. We have got special deal for Taj. We've got special deal for all the good hotels and I'm sure it's going to be a great celebration of entrepreneurship. On that note, I know Thai Bangalore is doing really good, very big, but Thai Toronto is not behind. 
I think so having Benjamin here as a keynote speaker, we have made our mark today. So let me introduce to you our keynote speaker for the evening. I would say we'll keep it more casual when we'll do a fireside chat. Ben is the president for Canadian Council for Innovators. Canadian Council for Innovator is a national business council comprising of over 150 CEOs of Canada's fastest growing tech scale-ups. Under Ben's leadership, CCI has emerged as a pivotal force in Canada's innovation ecosystem. He, along with his team at CCI, who are here, big round of applause for the team from CCI and Toronto Inc. to join us today. They are dedicated to advancing the interest of the innovation-based sector. They play a crucial role in shaping policies. I'll emphasize it again. Crucial role in shaping policies, and I'm sure Ben doesn't leave any stone unturned to make sure where the policies and how they should be shaped up. That optimizes the growth and foster economic development for across Canada. Those who have known Ben and who have heard him, and I have the and I have had the pleasure to have the same. I can describe Ben in one word: firebrand. Nothing less can explain. He is a true firebrand, and he brings wealth of expertise in advancing Canadian tech companies on both national and international stages. His dedication to acceleration, accelerating innovation and entrepreneurship has significantly improved Canada's tech landscape. And I mean this, he is committed. He's committed to ensuring that our nation remains competitive and at the forefront of innovation. Big round of applause for Ben. Thank you so much for joining us. I know how busy you are, and I'm glad people will get to hear your vision today with us. Thank you, Ben. Test? All right, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Okay, well, that was probably the nicest intro I've ever had. Um, I feel like it's a lot to live up to, but super excited to be here and to have this conversation. And um, we haven't known each other for a long time, but it does feel very deep and very rich in terms of the same goals, objectives that we have for, for our country and for our communities. So really thrilled to be here. I agree. I felt an instant connection. And I think so there's a lot to accomplish together, especially with Ty and CCI coming together. OK, so I know what CCI is. And as you know, there are delegates who are from outside Canada over here. So I want you to tell them what CCI does and how is CCI trying to impact Canada's startup and scale-up ecosystem? And if you have to measure what CCI has done so far, are you happy about it? Yeah, no, uh, lots there to unpack, but just kind of quick high level. Um, the council was created in 2016 um, by uh, Jim Balsilli, former head of RIM or BlackBerry, uh, and John Ruffalo, uh, previously of Omer's and, and now uh, runs Maverick. And really the idea is how do you build a tech ecosystem that supports scaling technology companies. In Canada, we uh, sadly have a bit of a branch plant mentality. You know, I've, I've made the, the comment that we're kind of colonial supplicants in some ways, where we don't actually believe in ourselves and believe in our ability to build successful technology companies. And if you look at the public policy structures, and I know we're going to get a little bit into yeah. it, Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go. If, you, if you look at the structures and how they're set up, they're actually in a lot of ways designed not to help Canadian companies advance and be successful. And so what we look at is how do you take different policies, and, and we kind of look at them in four buckets. We look at things like capital, we look at talent, we look at uh, customers, which is often government procurement, and we look at what we call freedom to operate, so things like IP, data, standards and regulations, international trade agreements, and how do you harness those to help domestic firms be more successful? And so we look at kind of each um, opportunity in terms of whether it be you know, uh, budgets that come out, how we can help influence them, how we can make them better. Uh, we, we work provincially and federally predominantly, 
Um, and I would say the issue that has me kind of firebrand right now is capital gains. I don't know if anyone in the room here is familiar with what the government is planning, but you know, we at the council have come out really strong against it because ultimately it's going to make it more difficult for uh, investment uh, in technology companies as they're looking to scale and grow. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we try and work to, uh, to dislodge. In terms of our impact and success, you know, it's um, one of those things where you often think you can do a lot more in a year than you actually can. Um, but uh, we're now kind of almost approaching a decade. And a lot of the conversations and things that we've advanced, um, it's kind of miraculous to sort of sit back and look and see what, what you've accomplished. But some of our really big wins as an organization was the global talent stream. Um, so it's an immigration process that allows highly skilled workers to come here uh, in an expedited process. You know, it used to take 10 months. Hopefully, it's now down to two weeks um, if you're sort of meeting certain requirements. So we've done a lot of interventions in terms of trying to raise the consciousness and um, really trying to look at how do we help you know, a lot of these folks in the room build more successful firms here without having to you know, move to the US or sell to you know, other jurisdictions. So at the end of the day, the council is really about building a prosperity strategy for Canada. It's really about how do we build successful companies that can go out, compete, go global, you know, raise billions of dollars, create tons of revenue, but ultimately pay for the things that we as, we as Canadians, as we as people who live here care about, healthcare, education, those, those, those key, uh, key tenants. Perfect, thank you, Ben. So my next question is, um, we live in a digital economy, and in a digital economy, innovation is the bread and the butter, which makes us go ahead and compete. In your experience, what are the key indicators and milestones which you take into consideration to judge the success of the Canadian innovation economy, and also what milestones that we should be looking at in the future to ensure that we have built a solid foundation for the next generation of startups in this country? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think, you know, first thing I would say is that uh, the digital economy is different than the tangible economy, right? So we went from an economy where brick and mortar and the actual manufacturing of things is where value was added. So you know, when we built uh, something like the Auto Pack, which is you know given rise to a lot of the the the, uh, the plants that are kind of in southwestern Ontario, those created good middle class jobs. And governments still have that mindset that you know this sort of traditional manufacturing and just creating a job. Um, not really kind of focusing on its productivity or its prosperity components is sufficient. And the challenge is that in an intangible economy, which we're now in, actual wages decrease because items themselves become replicable. Yeah. And so, you know, look at any of the large, you know, companies that exist, whether it be Amazon or Google, you know, Meta, Facebook, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they don't have huge facilities, right? They don't have... Um, sort of massive things that they're producing. And uh, we're actually not too far from, uh, uh, from sort of the old uh, Kodak site that was actually down, down in Toronto. But you know, as an example, Instagram and um, Kodak were actually worth the same amount of money when Instagram had 15 employees and Kodak had over 150,000 employees. So the reality has changed in terms of how wealth and prosperity is created, and governments need to begin to understand that. The challenge that we've really had in this country is that we actually have a political class that doesn't understand how the intangible economy works. And so they're still stuck in this idea of, uh, thank you, yes, yeah. Uh, they're still stuck in this idea that um, it is about actually supporting, you know, giving money for, for advanced manufacturing. So when we see a deal like Honda, I'm not sure how familiar folks are, but you know, Honda got $6 billion. Right? We're actually investing in a foreign company's future prosperity. We're not, in, we're not investing in our future people and, our, and ourselves. And that's the kind of shift that we need to have happen, you know, not only uh, at Queen's Park here in Ontario, uh, but also federally um, in, in Ottawa. And this isn't a partisan issue. This isn't a blue issue, a red issue, an orange issue. This is really a Canadian issue. And so part of what, and you know, reason I, I'm, I'm here is how do we raise this consciousness where we actually engage, where we actually participate? And so at the council, what we do is we look at where are there opportunities to create a lot of uh, change and begin to kind of shift the narrative on, on how people can be involved in actually helping to 
as corny as this sounds, educate a bureaucracy and a political class on what really matters. So we're applying pressure, and, and you know, at times we're, we're successful. At times things you know, move a little bit backwards. But uh, all in all, I think the, um, the, the tide has gone out, I think, in a lot of ways for Canada, where we've actually seen GDP per capita be stagnant for the last uh, for the last ten years, where we've seen you know uh, real divergence in places like you know Australia, Denmark, the U.S., where they're now like 25 percent richer than us. And so the thing is, if we want to continue our quality of life, if we want to be the place that you know all of our families have have come from to, to be here, we have to kind of renew that promise of what what has made us successful. Absolutely. For the just to simplify what Ben said, actually Ben just did a town hall where Alan Lau was there and they took a great bit of time to explain what is the difference between an industrial economy and the digital economy. So I'll give you a quick example from Alan, which things made really clear for me. So in an in a economy, as he was saying, Kodak, Honda, when it was an industrial economy, you build up the company, you build up the economy by having a big setup, a plant where jobs will come. Digital economy does not play that way. What a pad was sold for $840 million. In a digital economy, the value of a company is it is in innovation, its intellectual property, and technology, not the setup. For example, we don't have Airbnb big setup. We don't have a setup for Uber. But these are billion-dollar companies. So what we need to move from the ancient way of thinking, oh, we'll create a plant and we'll create a job, we need to keep the innovation, the intellectual property within the country. The investment in the innovation should come within the country. So in the future, when there exists, the wealth is created within the country, not VCs taking them in the US. Nothing against you, Ram. I know we need Silicon Valley too. But at the same time, we need to create the Canadian innovation here if we have to move from an industrial economy to a digital economy. On that note, Ben, you're working to create this consciousness. And if my example can help raise consciousness, I will take credit for that. Alan, thank you for writing the piece and explaining it so well. And Ben, thank you for bringing him. What policies CCI is focusing to change so we can actually contribute or actually ignite the Canadian innovation, actually support our startups and scale-ups in a better way? Yeah, so great, great, uh, great question. and and. I've got sort of a not sexy answer that I'm going to give, but then I'll try and make a few things sexy about it. Um, let me know how I do. So, you know, first piece I would say is that what we actually need to do is establish a relationship between domestic industry and government. And that sounds like really easy, and it sounds like, oh, that, you know, just, just phone someone, just, just make it happen. But if you look at how Ottawa and, you know, politics work, is it's actually really difficult to actually to, to penetrate that and to create narrative around how we have to support domestic and Canadian uh, Canadian firms. And you know, just to be clear, I'm not for autarky, right? I'm not for making Canada great again. You know, I'm not wearing a red hat. Just to be really clear, you know, I, I do believe in international trade. I do believe in in our ability, but we've got to actually believe in what we're doing and building. And so. When you look around Canada and you look at some of the policies that are that are in place, do they support Canadian firms, right? So let's take other associations uh, that exist. And now this is kind of the fiery part about what I'm about to say. You know, let's look at the Business Council of Canada, right? So it, it's a business council, sounds like it's for kind of Canadian capacity building. If you look who sits on the board, it's often Google Canada, IBM, Cisco Canada. So it's companies that are Canadian in name only. And so when NAFTA is being renegotiated with the US, the policies that come into the Business Council of Canada are ultimately coming from the Americans. And so what happens is we have this sort of polluted policy uh, community in this country that is about actually advancing foreign public policy over our own domestic. So when something like a dispute resolution system gets created, we end up adopting a resolution mechanism that's actually favorable to the Americans. And so when you begin to kind of play this out, you realize that our own ecosystem itself actually has been sort of captured from a public policy perspective. You know, a fun example I like to give is that Amazon met with the Prime Minister's office 104 times last year. That's twice a week. They've got to log all of those meetings. You can go onto the, the lobbying log. It's like, how, like, that's a lot of times to meet with you know, to meet with Amazon. And so the question becomes, how do we actually put firms uh, and companies here that are more at the center of public policy discourse? 
And if you look at regions around the world that are like Canada, so they're open, small economies, whether it be you know, Korea, whether it be the Nordic countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, Denmark, they really do a good job of making sure that domestic firms are at the center of how they decide to create public policy. And then from there, they begin to work and build relationships with foreign, uh, uh, with foreign firms and with foreign governments. And so that really is where we kind of spend you know, sort of our energy. Actually, you answered my next question within this, which was more about how do we bring the public sector uh, more in touch with the private innovators and bring the public policy discourse from multi-million or multi-billion, uh, multinational, multi-billion uh, companies like Amazon to more what Canadian founders need, what Canadian companies need, and I think so CCI is doing a good job. So I'll jump on to my next question. We know that in Canada, so can we move on to the next question, please? So we know Canada is built on immigration, and we have a lot of folks who are either immigrants here or who are in the immigration business. Can I just ask for a raise of hand how many people who are not, who are not first, who are, who are not second generation Canadian, but first generation Canadians here, who have immigrated to Canada? Oh, that looks so much like Toronto. We have 51% of people from outside Canada in Toronto. And just to let you know in terms of number, we have 150 countries being represented in Toronto. Nothing is like Toronto. And we are not a melting bowl like New York. We would like you to have your own identity. But this also proves that all this time, immigration has played a very important role in the Canadian economy. We know that we are trying to attract innovators. We are trying to attract technology builders and entrepreneurs. But this competition to attract innovators, great ideas, has significantly become much harder in the last couple of worlds. You think about Dubai, you think about Spain, you think about in every country. How do you think Canada as a country can continue to have immigration policies, what they should look like so that we continue to fuel innovation by attracting the most innov we in like innovators, entrepreneurs into our economy? Yeah, so you know, immigration is definitely what has helped fuel our country's prosperity. And at the council, uh, we've done a lot of work on immigration policy. Um, and I would say we've done the, the global talent stream, which I kind of mentioned you know, in, in an answer before. And, and really, it's this idea that you know, as a country that struggles to build scaling tech companies, we actually need to bring in the best and brightest. Right? We need to bring in and be open to uh, those people moving here and building this country. You know, when the um, Trump administration came in in, in uh, the United States, I don't know if folks remember, but they banned, you know, it was a Muslim ban, not a Muslim ban that, that happened. And the tech community in Toronto responded immediately. You know, no borders in tech and open arms. We don't care what you wear on your head, we care what's in your head. And that was a powerful movement that I think 80,000 people signed you know, a big petition, and it actually helped get the ball rolling on us being able to create the global talent stream. So I think a couple of things. I think one, Canada's ability to welcome people and to view it as a strength, I think is phenomenal. And that is something that very few places in the world have. So that, that's definitely one thing. But here's where I think we're making some big mistakes. I think, you know, in terms of and <laughs> cost of living, housing, Right? What I am now increasingly hearing is, you know what? San Francisco looks cheap compared to places in Toronto or Vancouver. Right? So I think definitely making sure that we figure out our housing situation, I think, is mission critical. And then the other thing is also, you know, in terms of bringing people to Canada or people coming here, making sure that when they come, the promise that is being offered of a better life of an opportunity to build something and to create, which is you know, why I think all of us have come here at some points. You know, I, I come from, from refugees from, uh, from Eastern Europe. That's the sort of the belief in it, that this was a place where you could build something. And I think we've broken that promise. And I think a broken promise is really dangerous because if you break it to people, that is what sticks. That's what becomes the overarching narrative. So you know, when, when, when people come here hoping to get a good education and to get a good opportunity, but find out that the academic institution that they've come to doesn't actually match reality, that's a problem. So I think that's an area where we as a country definitely have to step up and continue the promise uh, of what we, what we say we are to the people who are coming here. I think so the, the lesson we take it from here is we made a good policy based on does not matter what you wear on your head, 
What matters is what's in your head. Now we need to actually implement that policy that it does not matter how you look, how you talk, what your, what your accent is, what your pronunciation is, all that matters, who you are, what your skills are. In fact, Ben, the next question was, this is to get the talented entrepreneurs. Do you have anything special that how we can, we know that Toronto, Montreal has established themselves as AI hub. We are still the biggest magnet for talent attraction. We have technology experts coming from around the world, and I'll just give you a quick anecdote on it. I was in India in March, and I went to a gaming company, and uh, I was like, you, are you interested in Canada? And he says, my entire development takes place in Canada. And I said, why? He said, when I'm a gaming company and I'm developing a gaming software, I need the context of the cultural indoctrination of a player. A player in Vietnam in East Asia is going to play it very differently from a player in Colombia. One city where I have 14 developers from 14 different countries, getting me that context is Toronto. That's a big round of applause for us. So we are that technology hub. But what do we need to do? You know, Global Talent Street, you talked about. What do we need to do that in this competitive landscape, we continue to attract technology talent and we continue to retain technology talent here? Yeah. So I think, you know, in terms of the kind of diversity or strength, very much believe that. And, and we hear that from lots of companies that, that come here uh, and lots of companies that are building here, right? The fact that they're able to access so many languages and access so much uh, different different networks that kind of pump through it. So I think that's that's really positive. I think the, the big thing that we've kind of seen, though, on let's say something like AI, is that we haven't done a good job of actually building domestic companies that scale and that are actually able to compete. And so what happens is we've got fantastic universities, right? University of Toronto, Waterloo, uh, you know, list goes on York, and they're good at bringing you know people here to be educated and trained. But if you don't have a, a way to keep them, yeah. right? If you don't have if you don't have good jobs where they can actually see themselves you know progress or they can build you know, firms, you're really going to struggle in order to be able to keep them. Because people want to work on interesting projects. They want to work on dynamic projects. Yeah. I think the other thing I would say, you know, and this is definitely, you know, looking at something like the capital gains change, is that this taxation policy is going to make it hard to keep that really sort of top tier individual who does have the ability to make a tremendous amount of money. And what we're hearing is that in, in something like AI, you don't need you know, a total massive team in terms of being able to create a lot of impact. If you have one or two world leaders that actually build a whole sort of hub and spoke around them, that's actually how you move the dial. And so we need policies that really look at how to keep those sort of rock stars here. We had a, a really great announcement um, yesterday, I don't know if you folks know the company Wabi. Um, so Raquel is the CEO. It's an autonomous vehicle uh, truck company. And um, she just you know, landed a deal of $400 million. Originally from Spain, moved here for actually quality of life, wanting to live in an open, progressive uh, society. And you know, her desire for a lifestyle, I think, is great. And it's good that that's attracting people. But you've now got to couple it with an economic opportunity. And so you know, if we can double down on helping someone like that build a really successful firm, that's, I think, how you keep people. you you got to keep, you got to keep them interested. Yeah. So just to add to what Ben's, uh, Ben said, we need to keep people. And we are lucky at Thai. We have some of those founders here who've created big companies. And I would like them to keep coming at Thai events. So can I have a round of applause for Rustam, one of the founders for Canadian Unicorn One Password? And we need to hear them so we can build Canada. Thank you so much, Ben. This was very important for us to hear. People coming from Spain getting $400 million funding. This is just a start. We have unicorns coming over here. Situation is not that bad, but let me get to it. I know you, you don't mince words. You don't sugarcoat things. You, you tell things the way they are, and we have been listening to you. And it's important. Sometimes it shakes you up. And to shake up people, sometimes you need to give a very bleak picture. And you're really good at that. You know, you can really get everyone raising up, boil their blood, because that's your raising consciousness. This is a better way than meditation. Actually, he makes you listen. You focus on what he says. And I love him for that. And we all love you for what you do. But I want to ask this very straightforward. Are you optimistic about Canada's innovation economy in the next five to 10 years? Please say yes. We need to go home and stay happy. And how can people like us, 
who are sitting over here, who share the passion and vision with you, can actually work to build this optimistic future, if there is any. Yeah. So look, I'm uh, an eternal optimist. I sometimes can be a bit gloomy, and I you know, try and communicate uh, what I see happening and, and, and sort of using data points. And so, you know, first things first, I'm uh, someone who, who works to try and build a better ecosystem, tries to build and work with folks uh, that are keen to do it. So I work around people who are builders, people who spend all day, every day, you know, building companies and thinking that nothing is impossible. So that is definitely like the highest highs you can experience in terms of being with those types of people. So, you know, Optimist, let's just start there. Now I'm, now I'm going to give you the, the bad news, right? So if you look at key indicators, as I mentioned, you know, we're now 25% poorer than the Americans, right? That's about $20,000 a, a year less than you know, our, our southern neighbors. And look, I don't think that Canada should be, be like America, right? We've got to play an open, uh, small economy game, meaning we've got to pick a few areas where we're really successful, we've got to double down on that, and then we've really got to try and fight like hell to be winners in certain, in certain areas. But the numbers of where we're at do need to be talked about, right? Last year, we had 125,000 Canadians leave and go to the United States, predominantly for economic reasons, right? Because there were better opportunities, there were better jobs, there was more money to be made, housing was cheaper, right? If you look at um, sort of other areas of decline, right? The, the government, um, under one of its programs, tried to basically instill and create more entrepreneurship. So in 2020, or sorry, 2019, there was 14,000 small SMEs, tech companies that existed in Canada. And the goal was to try and get that number close to 22,000 by 2025. Well, we fast forward, and yes, we had the pandemic, and yes, we have had some challenges, but there's now about only 13,000 tech companies that are actually in Canada. So we've actually decreased, right? We've had an you know, increase in our population. We've, we've spent a tremendous amount of, of money as a country on things that haven't led to really the, the realities that we want. And so by taking stock of where we are as a country, by, by being pragmatic about the numbers, that's, I think, how we can kind of begin to go forward. And I believe, you know, and I've said this before, and the thing is, me and you are in, in agreement, so it's hard to kind of have a little bit of a, a bit of fight with you because you're 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 all, we're on the same team. But you know, I often think that you know, Canada is a smart people, but sometimes we're a dumb nation in terms of how we do things and how we look at things. So I'm optimistic because I do think that people are beginning to pay attention. I think people are coming together, people are organizing, and we are a dynamic, smart group of people, and I think that's really where sort of our hope is. So I think, you know, if we're able to turn things around and look at um, how fast certain businesses and companies grow, I think we've definitely got a shot. I mean, NVIDIA was what, 10 years ago, right? Nothing. And so that's just it, is that these things move fast, they move quick, um, but we've got to be pragmatic about the realities that we find ourselves in. You know, people always want to paint rosy pictures, people always want to say, you know, the world needs more Canada, the world needs more this. That's actually not true. We've got to make ourselves relevant in this century. I will disagree. Canada well, still needs more Canada. As you said, Canadians are very intelligent. They are loud, too. So I'll ask you to close that door at the back, please. Some Canadians are really loud. And <laughs> so if we close the door, that'll be thankful. They're networking, which, they is, are part network of, which is part of what they should be doing. We are Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, put our, we, are, we put our point of view forth. And uh, I have one more idea. If you talk to the policymakers, uh, as you said, we had 22,000 companies. We are down to 13. We should have big billboards on the border. We don't have guns yet. That might let people not cross the border, and we might, they might stay back here. So we still need more Canada because we don't have guns. Thank you, Jacqueline. We needed to hear that, am I right? So definitely, we don't have guns. We have universal health care. <laughs> And we still let people live the way they want. So that's a good thing about us. So I disagree with only on one thing. We need, still need more of Canada. On that note, I'll go to the next sector. I know we painted a gloomy picture, but that's not all of the reality. We know that some of the Canadian sectors have been highly recognized for their innovation. And some of them are, as we know, AI, uh, clean tech. We are really focusing on sustainable energy solutions. 
health tech, Canadian University spent a lot on R&D. We have the maximum numbers of, I would say, patent when it comes to health tech. And that gives me another example. I met two companies, one in Vietnam, one in Singapore. They were all working on health tech, and both were in the cardiovascular technology. And they all said, one country we want to go and start do further R&Ds, Canada, because all the guidelines which come in the cardiovascular sector, they're all coming from the Canadian universities. So we still have a hope, and we need you to make sure it becomes a beaming light of shine again. So which sectors within the Canada startup ecosystem you think are the most promising right now, and what we can do together, uh, when I say together, is the investors, entrepreneurs, visionary, thought leaders in this room to make sure that those sectors continue to sustain, grow, and compete at the international level. Yeah, so that's um, you know a really great question, and, and it's sort of like trying to pick your favorite child. Like you know, you, you kind of worry about sort of saying these things publicly, and then someone will hold you to it. So I'll give a couple answers, and I'll, I'll kind of come at them maybe from a few different ways. So I think on the health tech side, I think you raise a great point, right? We do actually have amazing research. We've got amazing facilities. The problem in Canada, though, is we don't actually procure what we create. And what I mean by that is, you know, we'll often have amazing technologies. Like I work with a company called IntelliJoint. So they build a perfect hip replacement. They come out of Waterloo. They sell everywhere but Canada. They cannot get into the Ontario healthcare system. They, they, they have just struggled through the sort of angst of that is procurement here. And so the thing is, we've got this massive, as you said, single payer system. We've got this massive universal healthcare tool. How do we unlock that to actually buy technology, right? Any innovator, any leader of any company will tell you, I would much rather have a purchase order than a grant. Don't give me a subsidy, buy my product. And what I'm not saying is, you know, don't just buy it because it's Canadian or you know, it's from, from UW. But if it is good quality technology, if it is world class, procure it. And so what I would say is on areas where we as a country spend a lot of money, so thinking about healthcare, right? Thinking about areas of defense, thinking about uh, you know, fighting climate, right? Where we've got you know, huge forest fires. Yeah. How do we make sure that the solutions that we're actually procuring are domestic? And by doing that, you build businesses, right? And good example I'll give you is how many of you are familiar with Ozempic? Anyone, 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 anyone willing to say they're on it? Hmm? No? Um, no, just a joke. Um, so uh, what I would say is look at like Ozempic, which is about, um, you know, meant to deal with uh, uh, diabetes, right? Created by the company Nova. Um, the company's been around for over 100 years, and the Danish government overwhelmingly supports it through procuring from it, buying solutions, marshalling funding for it, so going out and getting, you know, uh, investment dollars. It's had a amazing couple of years in terms of the product that they've created through, through Ozempic. Now, the fun thing that people don't often know is that Ozempic uh, was actually, the research was done here. It was done at the University wow. of Toronto. And that IP left, and it went over to Nova in, uh, in Denmark. Now, in Denmark, they actually measure their GDP with the company and without it. And it moves their GDP nationally by 7% which is a tremendous number for one company. And so when you think about innovation, when you think about how you create wealth and prosperity in the 21st century, you don't need that many companies like Nova to actually sort of turbocharge. So you know, I think that is an area that we as Canadians can accelerate and be really uh, phenomenal at. I think diversity also plays into that, right? I know obviously being able to work with diverse communities, diverse populations is critical, so that's one. And then the other I'll just quickly say is, is quantum. So we as Canadians actually have world-class quantum and we've got world-class startups. But if we don't support them, if we don't have government either purchase their product, if we don't give them enough sort of resources and capital, um, and that's another area, right? We struggle to give uh, investments in sort of later stage companies um, and they often have to find it you know, elsewhere. So what I would say is that's an area where I think there's a real uh, opportunity and promise uh, as a country. No, absolutely. We are the people who discovered or uh, developed insulin. I hope we capitalize on that, and we are doing that. Well, I mean, insulin ended up getting sold, and, and you know, it was created uh, near where Mars is, if, if folks are familiar. But, but ultimately, you know, the IP went south of the border, and you know, in certain jurisdictions, uh, they, they charge a, a tremendous amount of money uh, for it. So that's the kind of ex example, is that you know, we as Canadians funded all the R&D for it. You know, our taxpayers went to supporting you know, these types of uh, solutions. And at the end of the day, we don't benefit from it uh, the way that we should. So I think so we are listening. 
I also believe health tech has a major scope because we have strong IP, we have universities which are doing well. You have an example of Ozem Peak. It has changed everything for Denmark. I was in Miami and they took me through a boat tour to show me all the billion dollar homes on the thing. Everybody had this 80 million, 90 million dollar home. The guy who had the house for around, I would say, 700 million, which put even Beyonce's and everyone houses to a tiny cottage, was the guy who founded Viagra. So I'm sure health tech has a lot of money and a lot of scope for all of us. Yeah, very much so, very much so. <laughs> okay, great. So let me, this brings me to my last question. I have so much to ask, but it's that we don't have this venue for long and we have, uh, but we'll surely get you back another time. Canada has a rich history of innovation. We have Element AI doing well. We have insulin, we have companies, we have Canada Arm, the robotic arm which goes with space shuttle right now. They are all product of Canada right now. What do you think in the environment that we have government which needs to catch up with the digital economy and you're doing a great job in waking up them up and waking up the civil society to come and take action. But how can we as Canadian inspire and encourage innovative thinking about uh, potential future, what we have amongst our next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators. What can we do? Call for action for all of us today. Yeah, no, um, great question. I think, you know, first of all, coming and participating in events like this is critical, right? We are a, a social being and, and the ability to actually connect and engage is kind of step one. And that's you know, a little bit like motherhood and apple pie. It's something that we all sort of, you know, universally kind of uh, agree on. What, what I would say is that the perspective or the lens that we take matters. And in Canada, I think sometimes we get stuck in this idea that it's cultural that we're not successful, that it's cultural that we don't win you know, gold, that we go for bronze. And I think that's horseshit. Right? I think ultimately it is a structure and the system that we've created that's led us to not being able to have the outcomes that we as a people want. And so I think you know, as we think about how do we create the space for entrepreneurs, how do we create the space for leaders, how do we create the space for the next generation, it's about cleaning up some of the challenges that we're facing and looking at the structures and the policies. I'll give you just a quick example of one. So, Shred, does that, how many of you know about Shred? It's a research, yeah, okay, good, great, yeah. Hopefully you've, all, hopefully you've all applied for it. Anyway, Shred's $4 billion a year that the government spends on research and science and economic development. 18,000 companies receive Shred dollars. A lot of people like the program, they think it's good, but when you tell them that 20 companies that are Canadian in name only receive 50% of every Shred dollar, they get a little annoyed. And they get even more annoyed when they realize that Huawei received some of that money up until a couple of years ago. A company that we actually viewed as being unacceptable to be part of our telecommunication systems because it supports uh, an adversarial nation. And so that's sometimes the issue that we have here in Canada, is that we spend and do things that are not supportive of the local community. They ultimately lead to the funneling out of IP, to your point, and ultimately investing and creating opportunity for other countries and other jurisdictions and other people. So I think there has to be sort of a reclaiming of the place that we call home, a reclaiming of the work that we do and looking at each public policy and say to ourselves, is it making us better? Is it making us richer? Is it making us more successful? Yeah. Perfect, Ben. It couldn't have been a better ending and inspiration for all of us. We here will love to work with you and Canadian Council for Innovators to bring civil society together. We have City of Toronto representatives here. We have people from OCI here. We have RBCX here. We have people from other domains which are a key ecosystem player in the Canadian innovation economy to make sure that the government responds and our policies now shift towards from an industrial economy to more of a economy of innovation and digital. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was our pleasure to have you. A big round of applause for Ben. Thank, Thank you. you. Please, stay, please stay here. I would request uh, Hitesh, uh, if he's in the room, and our president, uh, Vijay Thomas, and uh, Mahendra Naik, chair for the board, to please come and felicitate uh, Ben. We have a small talk of love. Thank you for you.
We, we have Pitish coming if you can just wait for a minute. Does anyone live in Toronto, um, uh, St. Paul's, the riding? There's a by-election happening there. Anyone? Anyone? Anyway, it's going to be an interesting time. You'll be able to vote. Uh, and uh, if, you're, if you're struggling with how you feel the economy is going, if you're struggling with how you think things are going, you know, it's CCI, we're a nonpartisan organization, but there is uh, a by-election happening in Toronto. So there's an opportunity to participate. So I would say go out and vote uh, if you live there. I know it's, you know, just one riding uh, in, the, in the big city we live in, but there is an opportunity to participate if you are so lucky as to, uh, to live in that district. So just throwing that out there as, a, as an opportunity to participate. I, I would take that moment to ask one question. How many of you checked them out on LinkedIn as we spoke? So one thing that, that really pops out was, sir, with due respect, you were executive assistant to Christian Freeland. Yes. I was. So what went wrong? <laughs> So uh, yes, I uh, uh, was actually her campaign manager in 2015. Uh, I was her campaign manager in 2013, and I did work for her for, for a number of years. And look, I think she is a, a wonderful person, to be very clear. I think she's great. I think the policy is bad, right? And that's, I think, where we have to be uh, as, as folk. Um, but I think that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a misunderstanding of how the economy works. There's a misunderstanding. And, and let's, let's be clear, right? The Liberal government federally has been in power for the last almost decade, and we've had economic stagnation. And I think rather than actually trying to figure out how you grow the economy, how you make the pie bigger, we have a government that's trying to create a narrative around class warfare, where it's, you know, the rich people's fault that you can't have a house. It's the rich people's fault that healthcare is struggling. It's the rich people's fault that these things are happening, rather than kind of collectively bringing people together. So I think we've got a government that's you know long in the teeth. I think we've got a government that needs to uh, to consider um, you know different uh, different op options. And so you know there is an opportunity to to send a signal. Um, by elections matter, um, and so you know we'll see what happens over the summer uh, with uh, with the federal party. Thank you. I was just trying to give you a little trouble there. Yeah, no, I like, I like trouble. Add a thing to it. In fact, I'm really glad you brought this up. This for Ben, it is not liberal versus conservatives, and that's what I think. So we all love him about it. It's all about building Canada and supporting the innovation economy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ben, for this encouraging talk. You know, uh, we have been to a couple of town halls. He really invigorates you with passion with what he's doing. So when he was coming today, I had made a promise, and I asked him, can we make it all fun and make it good story about Canada? <laughs> Thank you, Ben, for keeping it very, very neutral. By no means that we don't have work to do. That's what, that's what democracy is all about the discourse that we bring together, the community that we put together, and how we bring civil society together. That's what the goal is all about. So on that note, thank you so much, Ben, and thank you so much the team for Canadian Council for Innovators and Toronto Inc. for being community partners for us for this event. We couldn't have done this without you. As we work to build a Canadian civil society, we also know that the society is not equal for everyone. There are marginalized people, especially in a country which is built on immigrants, and as we said, we, need, we have a great policy, but it still needs implementation. It does not matter how you look, what you wear on your head. Only thing should matter is who you are and what is in your brain. Unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do. And one of the segments which is more marginalized than anyone else is women entrepreneurs. And that gives me segue into the next part of our program. Today, Thai Toronto is holding our finals pitch competition for Thai Women Global Pitch Competition. The winner from today's competition is going to go to India with us to compete at the global level. We at Thai keep supporting marginalized entrepreneur uh, communities and foster entrepreneurship as much as we can do because we thoroughly believe small effort that we all make is one day going to turn into a big wave. On that note, I am really happy that Thai recently had the opportunity to actually take part with an event where we showcased a very interesting documentary called Show Her the Money. 
We were just one of the community partners, don't take me wrong. The leader of the, the, for hosting this event was Nadia Ladakh. If you don't know who Nadia Ladakh is, she is a very promising young woman entrepreneur, founder of the femtech, uh, fem health company called Marlowe. Not to miss here, she's also the winner of one of our acceleration program called TyQuest and chair for our acceleration program is over here. Kanchan, a big round of applause, who gets the best of the companies and mentor them. Most of our TyQuest companies actually get to uh, Thai 50 at the Silicon Valley, and Ram, you know the value of that, and some of them have also pitched to the Drapers. So when Nadia hosted that event, Thai couldn't stay back. We were not the only one who supported Nadia with the event. We had DMZ, Zizi, uh, marching for all the women entrepreneurs there. They were one of the main sponsors for the event. We got to work with Whitespace, York University, LOI Accelerator, Capital M Ventures, Talk Show, Elevate Faskin, and the list goes on. Doesn't matter who supported the event, it was all about this documentary. Trust me, this negative discourse that we keep hearing that only 3% of venture capitalist money goes to women entrepreneurs, that's true, that fact is true. But this documentary kind of showed that how the landscape is changing, how women venture capitalists are themselves coming forward to support other women entrepreneurs because they know Investing in women entrepreneurs is where the transformation happens. I would not go more than this. We have a small clip from the documentary. Only reason we are playing this clip together that if you haven't seen the documentary, please see. We need all of you to come. The movement doesn't start when the rolling of credentials go at, at the end. It starts when you leave that hall after watching this documentary that how we can all come together and make the change. Please, can we have the clip for the movie? If you think about all the technology companies that we know about today, they were all funded by venture capitalists early on. Historically, women have been shut out of the venture capital world. It has been on purpose. Money is power, and this is a very lucrative industry. I win. I was raised to believe that talking about money was in bad taste. Men always talked about it. Someone needs to do something about this. To be a founder takes grit. Dapper Boy is gender neutral clothing. I've been fundraising now for over a year. We're out of capital. I don't know what else to do. I'll never forget one investor. Good to move on. Asked me if this was just a passion project of mine until I had a baby. We connect breast cancer survivors to certify mastectomy fitters. So we joke that it's like Warby Parker for boobs. This could easily be a billion dollar company. Why are you an angel investor? I'm not gonna lie, I like money, right? But if I can invest and help another woman get somewhere they wanna go, it's a gift to get to do it. We have two companies that are already a billion and above. It's kind of unheard of <laughs> to have unicorns this quickly. If I write a woman a $10,000 check, she's actually gonna go much further with that money than a similarly situated male would. The returns are actually better when you invest in women. A study by McKinsey shows that investable assets controlled by women are expected to rise to $30 trillion by the end of the decade. What are they gonna do with that money? We support female founders. 10 years from now, we'll look like the geniuses, right? If these women don't get funding, what innovations are we gonna be missing out on that could impact the planet? Rockstar Life. It is already there in the theaters, this documentary. I can just assure you, share optimism. Share optimism you get after watching this drive. I just want to know how many venture capitalists we have in this room. Awesome. How many women venture capitalists we have in this room? I know two. A big round of applause for the change they are making. And this is how we come together at Tide Toronto to push boundaries, to break barriers, and create more exclusive environment for everyone to thrive. 
on that note, without any delay, I would just introduce you to the Thai Women Program, and then I'll ask MC for the evening, Neha, to come over and start with the pitching competition. In the meantime, while I'm introducing Thai Women Competition, I will request the judges to come and take their seats up front over here. And before that, as we said, we made it inclusive, and we make it powerful for everyone. So all those who are not judges today, you are powerful today as well. I hope all of you have your cell phones with you today. Can you please put your cell phones up for us? With your cell phone, you have the power today to give $1,500 to today's winner for the pitch competition. There'll be a separate winner from the judges side, but you will get to vote on the best pitch of the day you won and the audience choice purse award awardee will get $1,500 cash prize sponsored by our charter member, Raj Divan, and his law firm, DLP Piper. Thank you, Mahendra, for arranging that big round of applause. So, thank you. So, please come ahead. So, Susanna, Zizi, Disha, Hitesh, we have made it a very fair ground. We have four women judges, and we have one male judge. Good. That, that's inclusiveness. We are including all the men in the room. Big round of applause. Okay, so Thai Women is a program which is run by Thai Global again. Every chapter has its own competitions and we take our finalists to the next level. Why this program? Why Thai Women? It's a dynamic initiative dedicated to empowering and advancing women entrepreneurs. At Thai, we believe that transformative power of women led innovation and leadership, and this program is a reflection of the same. Through mentorship, networking, opportunities, and targeted resources, Thai Women Program aims to break down barriers, cultivate a thriving ecosystem where women can succeed and thrive in entrepreneurship. With the Women Program, our commitment extends beyond just support. It's creating a community, and that's what we are doing by bringing all of you together over here. We want to create a community where every women's entrepreneurial journey is celebrated, supported, and accelerated. Together, we are paving the way for a future where women entrepreneurs are not just recognized. We are way beyond that point. Recognition is done. We have given them enough mentoring. They need access to the market. They need funding. And we are leading that change with this competition. So with that round, a big applause for Thai Toronto Global for running this uh, global pitch competition. I would invite Neha to come over. And let's go through the pitches. Your vote matters. It's worth $1,500. So please vote, listen to every pitch, and let's see if your choice matches that of our esteemed judges. Thank you. Thank you, Basna. She's left her glasses here so she can see what I do now. <laughs> no hard feelings. We love men. I'm on the other side, so no hard feelings here. But we'll, we'll get started. I want to introduce um, our esteemed judges as well, starting from Zizi. Uh, Zizi is a man manager of venture recruitment at DMZ, a leading startup incubator, equipping the new generation of leading tech entrepreneurs with the tools needed to build, launch, and scale highly impactful startups. Then we have Susanna Wes, very long lost friend. Um, she's a senior manager, strategic planning and initiatives at City of Toronto, committed to fostering a positive and progressive workplace culture, and strives to build a workforce that reflects the citizens it serves. Then we have Jacqueline Luen, uh, Director, High Net Worth Relationship is Bur at Burgundy Asset Management. She serves as an independent global investment manager providing discretionary investment management for private clients, foundations, endowments, pensions, uh, pension uh, funds, and family offices. Then we have Hitesh. Uh, Hitesh, I, I, I know you feel the one left out there, but you, but I can place you in the middle of the ladies if you want. <laughs> He's definitely, he's definitely the lucky one. I, I've worked on, I worked in, in boards and in, in companies where I am the only one, so I've been very comfortable. So when people ask me, do you, do you feel like you know, you've, you've seen racism? Or when I moved here, I, I'm still called 
an early immigrant in, in Canada, six years down now. And when I was a four month old immigrant in Canada, I was given the opportunity to run an immigration program for international entrepreneurs. So every time somebody got me on the panel to know my immigration story, I was like, it's not exciting. You would not find anything spicy here. <laughs> so we have Hitesh Sasdev. He's the head of startup engagement, innovation, and investments at ICICI Bank. He's an industry veteran, has been with ICICI over two decades, and his specialty lies in blockchain and fintech industries. Last but not the least, we have Disha Nayak. She's a founder, of, a founder and CEO of Giggle. She's one of the top 10 food and lifestyle influencers in Canada, also an expert in influencer marketing, um, and top influencers in Canada with over 1.5 million followers and 1 billion channel views. We welcome you, all of you, and we have our top superstars that are gonna be pitching today, and we will, we will get it started because I know they have been waiting. So we have our first company. We have the founder, Lisa Hertz. Is Lisa here? All right. So Lisa is the founder of Women's Global Health Innovation, B Free Cup. WGHI is a social enterprise researching, developing, producing innovative period products and implementing menstrual health and hygiene programs in low and middle income countries. They are also the developers of the innovative Menstrual Cup and Be Free Desk and continue to partner with Canadian academic institutions to research and develop novel products focused on reducing period poverty, increasing choice and access, and improving health and socioeconomic outcomes for the girls and women globally. So we're going to just wait for her and she's here. Yeah, absolutely. So we have superstar number one. Feel at home. Here you go, Lisa. Well, thank you everybody for this opportunity to meet with you and speak with you this evening. I have a couple of questions for the audience, if you don't mind. And I know there's a number of people that are out there having some, uh, some food and libation, but we'll ask the folks that are in the room right now. Um, how many of you in the room have ever had a menstrual period? Please raise your hands. If you've ever had one, whether you're in menopause or now I have a second question. And the second question is, how many of you have ever purchased period products either for yourself, for a friend, or for a loved one? I love this. Yeah, this is great to see. And what this speaks to is that not only in this room, but beyond there, that period care products is big market. And it's a big market, I can say that it's globally. With 1.9 billion people globally having a period poverty, having a period product every month for some 45 years of their lives, this equates to a major market need for period care products. It's been easy for the big multinationals to corner this market because few people give it much consideration due to the taboos and the silence surrounding this particular subject. But this is all changing, and in a big way. Even the big multinationals know that major change is occurring. I have Kimberly Clark knocking on my door every couple of weeks. And savvy consumers with major spending power are demanding better than the plastic-based, uncomfortable, chafing of pads, absorbance, that generations before them just put up with. Millennials, especially Gen Z, are saying no way, no more, and consciously choosing to spend their money on products that are more comfortable, that are leak-proof, and friendlier for the environment. 
Hello, I'm Lisa Hertz, founder and CEO of Women's Global Health Innovations. We are a for-profit social enterprise and the developer of the world's most innovative period product, the Bee Free Cup. It's the world's only physically antibacterial menstrual product redesigned for comfort, ease, ease of use, and healthier, proven healthier periods with a low environmental impact. With our Be Free brand, we are, taught, we are taking aim at the lack of real innovation. There has been very little uh, in the multi-billion dollar a year period product market. The reality is that true cutting edge innovation is simply not happening in the period product sector until now. So what is the problem that we set out to solve? With traditional disposable products, namely plastic-based tampons and pads, there are many problems. Discomfort, abrasion, heat, odor, leaking, costly waste management for the annually billions of tons of period product waste ending up in landfill that take 200 to 800 years to decompose. There's a lack of convenience environmentally. They're unsustainable. Supply chain and stock out challenges, low margins, high taxes, and the list goes on. The Bee Free Cup solves for each of these problems plus more. Menstrual cups have finally gone mainstream with hundreds of thousands of users worldwide. We are so proud of that. That, you know, this is great news, but one of the major complaints with traditional menstrual cups in themselves is the need to boil them monthly. This poses a challenge for millions of people uh, with limited access to water, to clean water, and it's also a hassle for those who just don't want to boil their, their cup here in Canada, the United States, you know, on and on. With the Bee Free Cup, we are aiming to change the way people view period products in general, to understand that innovation for better period products is possible, and ultimately to improve the way people view the exper and experience their, peri their, their period. This awareness is already impacting consumer choice. According to an industry insider from, and I'll say it, Johnson & Johnson, the Bee Free Cup is the most innovative period care product since Kotex put adhesive on the back of a menstrual pad. That's really saying something because that was done decades ago. The Bee Free Cup stands out because it's physically antibacterial, meaning it doesn't need boiling to clean, and, and consumers the world over are loving this. It is material, materially superior, made from a novel, uh, physically antibacterial silicone that we developed. We developed here in partnership with the University of Toronto, material science engineers, microbiologists, physicists. So very much looking at, you know, from a women's health perspective, really raising the bar to get the best possible products out there. One Bee Free Cup is conveniently reusable for years. It's comfortable, convenient, environmentally friendly, with a novel design that stops leaks. Uh, a common issue with all, with all of the other period products. We closely watch consumer trends in our key markets, Canada, the United States, and other international markets. Um, uh, in, uh, did, sorry, uh, in markets where, that have a low medium, median age as well, including India. Uh, India has one of the lowest uh, median ages in the world at 29. And uh, it's a rapidly and rapidly emerging African market. Um, there is democratic, de demographically, is the lowest population in the world with a median age of 19. So you can see that you know a vast number of the population are still within their reproductive years, and women are having a period of for 25 percent of you know their month. Um, we are highly differentiated from the competition, but maintain competitive pricing with top U.S. sellers. Uh, with, mag with the magnitude of this globally expanding market and the current market valuation for period products and estimated at over 28 uh, US billion, uh, this is estimated to reach 53 billion by uh, 2032. The Bee Free Cup is offering a highly profitable and disruptive alternative in the period care sector. The globe, global market opportunity for menstrual cups is growing quickly. Menstrual cups are no longer the outlier they once were. They have gone mainstream with a CAGR outpacing the growth of both tampons and pads. We have a, a global multi-channel market-based strategy that has been tested and validated with novel and profitable sales models being tested to direct 
uh, direct budgeted funds from cor corporate ESG, valued in 2024 at US $2.1 billion, and CSG, where the top Fortune 500 companies have invested over US dollars $20 billion. Our numbers support our projections for steady growth with high margins, especially from our direct-to-consumer e-commerce channel. Likewise, our sales and international NGOs have proven to support volume sales with high margins, higher margins than our retail sales channels. Of course, we consider economies of scale, strategically growing our B2B growth. You can see from our timeline, we've, had, we've made steady inroads and tractions. We are on a steady trajectory with some interesting disconnections currently happening, discussions happening, uh, giving us the confidence that the Be Free brand will be the leader in the sector by 2023. Recently, in April 2024, we were successful in achieving our Health Canada uh, approvals. As everybody in the room, and somebody was just talking about that hip replacement, I'm sure that's the, re the restrictions on uh, getting it into the Canadian market because it is a tough, tough going. Um, so we have, it, because the menstrual cup is a class two medical device, with, so we need, required both our ISO 13485 as well as our MedSAP certificates, which we've achieved. So now we're back on the Canadian market. As, as an innovation company, we have negotiated key partnerships to create new category products to advance period product uh, innovation while securing our current and future intellectual property making sure that we have that moat around that intellectual property for our freedom to work. Additionally, the Be Free Cup has been recognized by the US-based organization PATH as the best menstrual cup for both the international humanitarian and development, uh, um, and development market sectors where there are billions of dollars sitting and waiting for these projects and programs, um, some of which we've had been fortunate enough to be supported um, and involved. And a little on our social and environmental impact to date, we've reached over 30,000 marginalized adolescent girls and women in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Colombia, saved over 20,000 liters of water and diverted over 1.2 million plastic-based pads and tampons from landfill. And we've only just begun. And here's a map of the countries where Be Free Cup users live and work. And you can see that we have certainly made some Headway in uh, in India, in particular, where we are, we have a new partner, uh, recent new partner with Pregna Industries out of Mumbai, who is actually the largest producer of um, of IUDs, the largest producer of intrauterine uh, devices for women in, in the global market. And of course. Achieving lofty goals takes true teamwork, and our Be Free team is purpose and performance-driven group with a range of experience and expertise that has built the strong foundation necessary to get a category-shifting, differentiated product, period product, successfully to market. We are a brand on a mission, positioning ourselves to be the global leader in innovative, sustainable, category-redefining, and reusable period care products by 2023. The mission this mission influences our strategic plans for growth. We leverage all funding opportunities to achieve this objective. We are going for gold. And we are currently raising US, in USD 2 million, very specifically to expand our team, uh, especially our C-suite team, to build Be Free brand uh, recognition as a globally disruptive product. And, e and equally vital to support our, our marketing push for D to C, B to B, and international part, uh, strategic partnership growth. And to optimize our manufacturing, we are manufacturing here in Canada. It's interesting in regard to I look at like either or, I look at industry plus, you know, um, uh, industry as well as digital. We do work in digital as well in regard to our education, but I think it's both, you know, that we can build both here in Canada uh, and should. Um, and we have been fortunate to get that kind of support from the government of Canada through their international development, uh, through Global Affairs Canada. I really thank you for your time today, and um, I'm open to your questions. Okay. 
I can start. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much, Lisa. It was a great presentation. Um, for any founder, uh, there's always a personal story as to why you get into the business that you get into. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious to hear what, was, what prompted you to get into this particular business? I have seen period poverty around me, the embarrassment of having a period, even as an adolescent myself. I'm very focused on adolescents in particular, um, and adolescent girls in particular. Um, I was an athlete as an adolescent, and that kind of shyness around having your period kind of brought you out of the gym, didn't want, you didn't want to pr participate in the field hockey or the, the field football or soccer, however you are from the east or the west, and how you, and it just, it really, it, you know, has, has such a negative impact. I think menstruation has such a negative impact, and that's related to the taboos around it. It's also related to the fact that the materials just haven't, haven't, um, haven't kept up with, like women giving feedback that, you know, 100% of the women that I ask who use pads, I say, do you get chafing with your pad? I have yet to hear a woman say no. And that's not right. This is a health issue. So, you know, it was something that was on my mind since I was an adolescent, looking at, you know, I was a very creative person and always thinking probably an engineering mind and also looking at public health. Um, at one point I was a clinician, so I was working with patients uh, in public health and looking at, we've got to do better. We've got to do better for the women in the world. Um, I, unless we have, uh, an end to the menstrual, menstrual uh, menstruation as, as a taboo, as a stigma, we are not going to achieve gender equity because as long as women are considered sick or weak, you know, the, which is quite the opposite, um, we have, we're great in endurance, scientifically proven, that these, these, this narrative, which also is related to the products that we use, the education that we receive, um, and, and making sure that, you know, we're out there changing the narrative, and I really, at base, want to change the narrative, but also to do that with better products, um, that, you know, what, peop what women were settling for isn't good enough. And there's all of this innovation, we are just coming from collision, where there's a tremendous amount of money being poured into innovation for all other things, you know, um, from everything, from you know the foundations of your business and IT and AI, and it's just like periods will never go digital. That is a reality. So where are we going to innovate? And we are going to innovate through new material science. We're going to innovate in design, but we're really going to innovate by listening to the Gen Z out there, those in the reproductive years. What do you like about it? What you don't like about it? And how can we do better? Thank you. Lisa, thanks for a great presentation. And uh, I see Julie Ellis is uh, one of your influencers, and uh, she's a great person as well. And uh, so thank you for that. Um, you know, our task tonight is to allocate um, prize money to someone who's actually going to use it. Like, how is it going to be used? So, um, you know, watching your presentation, I'm confused because, you know, yes, we all know this is a billion dollar business. and. Um, but you've got such a big, broad market there. Like I, we were talking about immigrants. Who's an immigrant? I'm an immigrant. I'm from Zambia. Ah. So you're talking about Zambia. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, how the heck are you doing that? Are you doing it with Coke? Have you partnered up? Partnership who's, with who's, who's, Rotary. Who's, right, so Rotary, right? So now if I'm an investor, how am I gonna make my money back? That sounds like a not-for-profit. It is definitely a for-profit. So the sales that we're making, again, looking at Africa and the Africa, it's an emerging, it's an emerging market. Um, it is not about charity. It is about building the market around and working with the sustain sustainable um, uh, health and fu hygiene fund through UN Ops and, and closely, uh, you know, those partnerships, those collaborations, those advisors. And we're looking at the only solution is through a market-based approach. We're not looking at this as, as a, a not-for-profit, and that is investors, that the investors are going to get a return. I can tell you that our sales to, to uh, the international NGOs and through uh, ECHO from Europe, the EU Commission, those margins were 35%. So, and then when we're talking about you know, economies of scale, and as that continues to grow, 
there is very significant, like we're looking at, you know, within five years, we're looking at annual sales of 60 million plus. So it's so very say, highly profitable. But I didn't product. see that at all. In, in Sorry. The, yeah. 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 I, I yeah. didn't see that at all. I'm just trying to give you feedback. No, thank you. And thank you. Also, yes. if you've got India and Africa and you're uh -huh. what? A startup? I, it just doesn't. If, if you had just said to me, just Zambia and here's how we're doing it and unpack that, I would have had more confidence. But to give you um, a, the prize money tonight, I don't have confidence in how are you going to focus that? The, it's interesting in regard to being in Africa now for a decade, and it's building those relationships over that decade. So having building demand on the ground in Uganda or in Kenya, uh, now in Ghana as well, as well as the Rotary Club doing a lot of um, you know, publication in regard to bringing the attention of and that this is the, this is the product solution for this product, and we hear it over and over again. You're coming in and you're teaching the girls how to stitch their own pads. And then they, they follow up with bringing in the Be Free Cup. And the result is, why didn't you start? This is the result of the mothers and daughters saying, why didn't you just start with this product in the first place? Yeah, I absolutely understand the problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're really focusing on all the time. I want to find out if you get $100,000 what will happen to that? What's the bridge? This, like, to me, it sounds like a bridge to, it's very vague. Um, you know, I wouldn't feel confident I'm gonna get a return. I, d I don't hear that. Like the problem, S I understand it completely. Right. And I think that's what you're really focusing on tonight, and I wanna hear the business case. Yeah, so in regard to, say, an investment of $100,000, you know, what we'd call that is patient capital. You know, you're getting, you're getting your shares or your safe or your, you know, your you know, um, convertible debenture, however that is negotiated, and they're looking at that as being patient capital, as well as the conversation on, and advisement on where do we best invest this money? Like, where are we getting the return on this? the you know we're looking at we're looking at a return high return in those countries and in the low and middle income countries through those partnerships through peace psi um through care ugandas through the and it's building up those relationships as well as through the sanitation and hygiene fund that have come to us as well as said here here's some funding to help you to grow that we are just now working with the aga khan development network and with them with that working on a model that schoolgirls, and now we've tested, tested this model in northern Uganda. We went into schools, in a couple of schools, we provided the product first. We provided the education to the girls and both the boys in sort of separate rooms at first. You know, we do baseline, midline, endline. So we did the baseline, girls and boys separate, trained them on starting with puberty from both, you know, the male perspective and female perspective. So they had an understanding of what each of them is going through. And then with that, we, dis we distributed the cups, came back in three months, and brought the girls and the boys together. Now we use dance and music and storytelling, so edutainment in regard to kind of engaging them at that particular age. And when we came back and brought the, you know, those, the, those two teams together, it was just like, okay, what are we really going to see here? And what we saw was that the boys raised their hand and asked, where can I buy this for my mother? So it was interesting to see that it wasn't they were, were not expecting a handout, that they were expecting that it would be an, uh, a market-based purchase in the, you know, in the local village. So that spoke to commerce, that spoke to bringing livelihood, potentially like earn, you know, jobs within the community. Then you, know, then you hear the boys also say, hey, those girls are missing less school. You know? So then when you're looking at you're looking at, so that's Africa. Now in India, just in 2022 alone, the number one selling cup, which is called Serona, and we ourselves have had a lot of converts from Serona over to our Be Free Cup, one yesterday, by the way. And the problem is that cup leaks, and I'm having problems with it, and here, try the Be Free, and they're like, finally a cup that doesn't leak. So speaking, to Indians in particular, where that middle market was purchasing these cups, and that's where we would be going, is the middle market. 
in India in 2022 alone, they sold 440,000 Serona cups, which were not manufactured in India. They were manufactured in China. And they're not a high quality product. They need to be boiled. There are all of these issues that, so, but that middle market, as well as the awareness that, and even when you see the, the, the incline of the CAGR for menstrual cups, you know, we're at a change here, we're at a, we're at a nexus where menstrual cups are going up and the sales for pads and tampons are going down. You know, a big market for us is Canada. A big market for us is the United States. So we're managing that and I'm pointing over to, you know, business management director here, uh, uh, Robin, who, you know, she's very focused on that American market where half the sales in the world are coming out of the US right now. Uh, we were also developing new products for those tampon users, and I'll break it down like 1.1 billion in sales in menstrual cups annually. This was the last year, the report of the last year. In the last year, 8 million are sold in tampons. The largest percentage are in menstrual pads. So if we're thinking about converting users, we would be looking at those tampon users. And we have a product that's being patented right now, which helps to facilitate that the reason why tampon users are resistant to using cups, which is, you know, as opposed to absorbing, they're now going to be collecting. Should I throw in my line? I always say women, it's, it's enough collecting. We all have to start, it's enough absorbing. We have to start collecting. So it's, it's a product that's used in the cup and you're not pouring out, you're not pouring out a liquid, but it's a product that is flushable. So it makes that aspect of it's much friendlier, easier, more convenient, and more comfortable than using a tampon. But again, it's listening to the tampon users. Why wouldn't they convert over to a cup? And then going into research and saying, we can, we can solve this through an environmentally sustainable solution in an affordable way that really helps to get away from those um, plastics that are burnt you know, in every building here in Toronto and every, you know, that the trucks come and take the bio waste and they have to travel it all the way to, they travel it all the way to uh, Niagara Falls, actually, where the incinerator is. I mean, most people don't understand what is really involved in disposing of menstrual products. The protocol is they must be insert, incinerated like hospital waste and the costs associated with that and how many women don't want their waste to be. So there's a lot of, I think, value from from the end user looking at this is better for me, it's better for the environment. I know that my, my blood is never gonna be seen by somebody else or my wasted pad. You know, I don't have the chafing. So I absolutely take, you know, in regard to, you know, this was a very high level, but there's those opportunities that, you know, it is a large market, you know, or next, 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 to, next to the company that, you know, we're kind of like, bumping up against is Flex, and their sales last year were 68 million. So it is, it is, it is, a, and we're def differ definitely differentiated from those. Um, it is definitely a moving, uh, changing landscape, specifically for Gen Z, that's saying, actually, light bulb moments, like, really? It does that? Oh, that seems so much easier. And then the, tr the feedback we get from all of our channels is that, this has changed my life. Over time. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. The next one up we have Sophia from Hope Pet Food. I'll be brief. Um, this is the last. Um, do you want to prepare the oh. picture? I'll just go back. Sorry. It's not. Yeah, I'm here. Got it. 
Um, sorry, I'm a, this podium doesn't work for short people. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sofia Bonilla, and I'm the founder and CEO of Hope Pet Food, and I'm excited. Okay, I'm excited to tell you more about Hope and how we are creating better pet food with novel ingredients from insects, algae, and fungi. So the problem that we're addressing is our over-reliance on traditional proteins to create pet food. This is a problem for both pets and the planet. It's a problem for pets because if you have a dog, of um, no people that have a dog, which is most people here, um, there is a growing number of pets with food allergies, specifically allergies to chicken, beef, and fish. About 35% of pet parents think that their pet has a sensitivity or allergy to, any, to something in their food. And it turns out that about 96% of food allergies in dogs are due to livestock, poultry, and fish ingredients. On the other hand, we know that pet food creates a massive environmental impact. In fact, it's up to 70% of that impact is due to traditional animal proteins. So the single most impactful change that we can make in pet food to address both allergies and its environmental impact is to, re to remove traditional animal proteins. But that's easier said than done because plants don't have all the nutrients that pets need. So they cannot really be fully vegan. And that's why we created Hope. We use alternative proteins and novel ingredients from insects, algae, and fungi to improve the well-being of the fur family. Our ingredients and our products are hypoallergenic. We use nutrient-rich ingredients in science-backed formulas. Um, we can ensure that is high pal palatability in our products, so over 80% of dogs love our products and we can reduce the environmental impact of pet food between 50 and 70% when compared to traditional animal proteins. The timing of this solution is also right. Pet food is a thriving and resilient market. It's worth over $120 billion globally, and the segment that we're, that we're approaching is the alternative protein pet food segment, which is still in its infancy, but considering the plant-based and insect protein markets, we can estimate that it will be about $10 billion in the next five years. There are also very important dri market drivers that, that will continue fueling growth in this market, uh, namely premunization, functionality in pet foods, sustainability, and the, and the fact that we're seeing food as medicine, both for humans and pets. So I'm the founder, I'm the CEO, I'm founder, I'm a dog mom, I'm a human mom, but I'm also a scientist with over 15 years of experience working at the intersection of biology, environment, and engineering. My expertise is in proteins, and I lead this small and mighty team and with the help of advisors, and we have the technical and operational experience to grow hope into a global leader in the alternative protein pet food. Our initial line of pet foods is insect-based, so that's what we have available in the market. So we have dog treats and dog food, mainly with insect protein, but we have um, registered and unregistered IP in future lines, which are namely fungi, fungi protein-based and algae protein-based. So what's the competitive landscape? As I mentioned, the, there is already a market for alternative pet food protein pet food, we see our competitors in different, in two mainly different groups, pet, foods that are, pet food companies that are um, presenting themselves as sustainable but still use meat-based products, and then the other, the other companies are meat-free alternatives, mostly either insect protein or vegan plant-based. How we differentiate ourselves is that we're creating pet food products, but we're also looking at novel ingredients that should be in pet food. So we have uh, patent pending formulas and patent pending ingredients that we want to see in future pet food products. We also have our in-house animal nutritionists, so we don't want to be a boutique pet food brand. We really want to compete with the Hills and Royal Canin and create these alternative protein portfolio or pet food products. So we're reaching customers where they shop. 
Our focus right now is in retail. So we have two brands that serve specialty pet and the grocery channel. We're also in a couple of vet clinics, but it's a channel that we haven't really pursued strongly. Our value proposition is high polargenic sustainable protein, natural ingredients, and science-based nutrition. Next, we will, we will invest in direct-to-consumer and e-commerce channels, and we want to really invest in brand loyalty through edu education because we believe that there is so much to educate pet parents about um, these novel ingredients. So we've made significant progress in the past two years. Um, we launched our first line of products, as I mentioned, and we've secured distribution across Canada. We're currently in about in over 70 stores. Um, we have patent pending ingredients. We've bootstrapped until now, and we're raising our first dilutive um, round of funds, uh, a pre-seed. We're also B Corp certified. And we have distribution in specialty pet in Western Canada and all, all of Canada in grocery channel. So we are anticipate obviously that with this distribution network we'll be able to grow um, significantly in the next few years and that's why we want to um, find these um, new funds to fuel that growth. Um, so we expect our annual sales to be in 1.7 million in the next fiscal year and then 5.2 after the US expansion. So we're raising $400,000, this is in US dollars for our pre-seed, we've secured 80, 75%. Um, this is really to leverage the distribution that we acquired and continue product development. We've also secured $400,000 in non-dilutive funds to invest in research and development and product, and, and product development. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm open to questions. Sophia, yeah. uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my name is Disha, by the way. I'm the CEO of Giggle Group. Um, and we're not in pet food. We're in influencer yes. marketing, so a little bit different. Um, but I'm also a mom of a German Shepherd, so I love to you know, see what the new foods are out there. So congrats on you know, all the success you've had so far. Um, although our companies are different, I think you know, the success of a company and you know, really takes you forward is that vision as a founder. So you mentioned you, know, you see yourself by 2026, 2027, reaching about 5.2 million in sales. Can you walk through me a bit what your vision is and how you're actually gonna achieve that and get to that number? Yeah. Um, so there are... Um let me just get my thoughts in order. So there are two aspects of our, of our growth. The first one is product development. So we currently have our, our line of insect-based dog foods. We just got uh, approval of um, non-dilutive grant to develop our fungi protein line. So we'll see growth from line extension, so more products. Then the other is access to these distribution network in Canada, which provides access to over 4,000 points of sale in grocery. And if we consider also in launching in the US, we know it's, it's a massive market. So we've done, we have our financial model and we've looked at how many, so in, in a year, we need to be in about 300 stores. We have a pipeline of, of stores that will take us to 100 stores in, in about two to three months. So we, we have the, the milestones to get there. I want to stop because I know time is. <laughs> I think anyway, you know, uh, I can you know, hear. I, I, I do the, you know, see that you know, almost two years now. You are you know kind of into this, and uh, you know what are your marketing strategies? I, I I checked your Insta you know account. I think there are only eleven hundred followers. You know I mean two years into when. I checked your just, I mean, I was trying to understand what are your marketing strategies, right, for this. I was checking your Insta account, right, and I could see only 1,100 followers, right, I mean, so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what is the channel you are trying to kind of, you know, uh, get into, you know, creating this brand, yeah? Yeah, that, that, no, that's a great point, and that's really the gap that we have right now. So I'm a technical founder. My background is I've been all my adult life in a lab or in a university, and so I understand that I have a gap there, and it definitely, um, shows in my team right now. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why I decided to pursue um, external funding because I know we have that gap. We need to hire someone that can take that marketing sales function to the next level. 
and we just hire one engagement uh, community. So hope to grow that. <laughs> awesome, because I had a following question. Have you ever calculated your CAG? Because I trust it should be high competing with other products over the counter. Um, you mean customer acquisition costs? Yes. Yeah, so difficult to calculate because we have not invested in marketing. So we have paid zero social media ads, well, maybe like $500 over the two years. So everything that we have right now is organic growth. So that's why we also want to invest in that marketing function. Um, we, so just, have just a couple of metrics to, to say. We have about over 70% returning customer rate in our D2C. So we have really good returning customer rate. And also what we found since we launched the complete and balanced food is that people actually subscribe. And so we get that increased monthly recurring revenue. While with treats, um, customers would wait three to four months to reorder. With food is a monthly um, yeah, sale. Do we have time for one more yeah. question? Yeah. Okay, good. That was great, Sophia, thank you. I am not a pet mom, uh, but I have kids that are desperate to have a dog, uh, but that's a different conversation. Um, I'm very curious about, um, I know you, you are the scientist, the technical brain behind this. Um, you mentioned that you have an in-house R&D component um, and uh, expertise. In your team, would that be you? Um, so partly me, but we also have an in-house animal nutritionist. So she has a master's from University of Guelph. Um, so she brings that nutrition, animal nutrition perspective. I bring more the, obviously the vision, but also the idea of using novel ingredients because that's what I did for m most of my research life, just looking at different ingredients. Okay, that's great. Yeah. And just to follow up to yeah. that, um, when we were looking at the way you're marketing and kind of, you know, you've got, you've got good traction with stores, you're, you're on Amazon. Um, what about the, the, the nutritionists, the, the pet nutritionists and vets? Can you talk a little more? I mean, are you actively pursuing that as well? Or is that not part of your outreach? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to be short because it's a, it can be a long answer. So um, we are in two vet clinics right now. Um, they approached us. They are our best customers when it comes to direct relationships. Um, so there is potential in the vet channel. However, like each channel has um, different um, details to address, and so they, we have like different distribution networks, different margins, different formats. Um, so we had to focus on one on, on one channel, and we decided to focus on the grocery right now because that's where we have kind of wide distribution. Um, but I will add that we recently added an advisor to our advisory board, which, who is uh, the veterinary chief officer of the Toronto Humane Society. And, and that was strategic because we really want to understand better that channel. And we, I know that we belong in that channel, just not yet. That's it? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. I must tell you, the pet parents are very loyal customers. So she's already got some. <laughs> That's why we got to more work on the marketing part of it. But thank you, Sophia. Next up, we have our superstar number three, Cynthia Ann from Nunafab. Good evening. I'll adjust it a little bit up. <laughs> My name is Cynthia N.A. and I'm the co-founder for Nunafab Corp. At Nunafab, um, we're utilizing STEM to reimagine materials for construction and manufacturing. How did we get here? My why? Um, I always like to start with that. Um, 
Over 10 years ago, um, as a, an engineer, a chemical engineer, I was invited up north to Nunavut. I did some work up there, and while in Nunavut, I didn't think I'd stay there long, but I fell in love with the people. And it was one thing to hear about affordable housing crisis over the news. It was another thing to meet the people who were feeling the affordable housing challenges. And so as an engineer, I rolled my sleeves up and I started, I got involved in affordable housing construction. While doing affordable housing construction, I was shocked at the materials in the space. As being one of the few black women I knew in that domain, I noticed gaps and opportunities that others didn't. And so I started innovating materials and collaborating. Um, if you stop and take a look right now around you and think about your home where your children are, over 95% of the materials around you are made from petroleum-based products or petroleum polyols. And this is not sustainable. We know that in Canada alone, there's 40% reduction in emission targets. There's all this regulatory climate pushing industry towards improving. And not just regulatory pressures, but consumers, when asked, over 71% of consumers expressed that, yes, I, I would want more sustainable materials. I want low VOC paint. I want more biodegradable materials in, the, in my automobile, in the materials all around me. So there's a need. And there's increasing penalties for industry that don't make this switch. So we have a patented, Canadian patented, I enjoyed the presentation before, all Canadian 100% patented technology for a biopolyol. So polyols are utilized, are foundational building blocks used in manufacturing. And majority of the polyols in the industry are petroleum polyols. And we've developed a biopolyol material um, that is renewable. And when tested, even we've shipped it out to customers, Shell, you know, the big, big, big conchos in the industry, they've actually confirmed that in functionality it's superior and it's sustainable and, you know, we're gaining some traction. So it's a huge market. If it's in everything, it's a very big market. Currently, uh, we would size the polyol market itself at about $78 billion, and the biopolyol market currently at $10 billion. And India is actually um, one of the countries leading in making biopolyol today. And India makes biopolyol from castor seed. Castor seed and castor plants um, is not a plant that can grow well in Europe or North America. And so those markets aren't able to make biopolyol. Um, they, you know, there's a demand to import from India. But we know that in India alone, um, if you look at the pie shape of polyol, um, they are a leading manufacturer, but they import still two thirds of the polyol that they need in their local market. So it's a huge maker of polyols, but still a huge importer of the polyol because of the manufacturing needs. Our product is a biopolyol based on um, coral and flax seed, so plants that grow in North America and the European market, giving Canada an opportunity to play in that space because we can't do it with castor seed. So in terms of our comp competition, um, you know, we're looking at capturing uh, five to seven percent of this market in the next 10 years. And we're going to do this by beating the competition. Um, in terms of color and odor and functionality, because there's some applications where, you know, the color, the odor, the functionality, these are important to, to industry. We've tested and we've seen that we're quite superior. Um, and in terms of traction, you bet we're making traction. We have over 6.3 million in sales pipeline. And, you know, in the past year alone, we basically, we, we joined an accelerator and we got some power and advice and we went door to door knocking. We joined 
different um, growth programs at Shell, at Joat, and we shipped product out and got them to sample it, to do their analyses, to come back and give us product valid validation, let us know how it performed. And so we know what spaces that the market is interested in our polyols, specifically for adhesives and paint applications. And so, yeah, we're working it and building that traction. We're also excited because um, we were recently announced in the Canadian federal budget um, we got a $1.5 million in non-diluted funding, super excited, lots that we can do there. Um, but most importantly, uh, we're looking for the traction to gain access to the market in India because it is a huge uh, manufacturer of polyol, but uh, a huge consumer of polyol. And I dug into it more and I'm trying to understand the constraints without, within India in particular. And it's just because there's a shortage of the raw materials they need to make more polyol. And even though India also grows canola seed, maybe our patented formula would be a solution um, for that. Our business model, and you can ask more questions about this, at the core is about relationship building. Working with all the way from farmers to the end user clients, and I wanna talk about the farmers in particular. We're absolutely the right team to deliver on this. I myself, I'm a licensed professional chemical engineer with over 15 years industry experience. Um, my co-founders, Solomon Amuno, um, Dr. Solomon Amuno, and Professor John Curtis with the University of Calgary are experts in those domain, led by a whole team of um, PhDs and postdoc that help us innovate on our R&D, as well as Ms. Scarlett, who is, has over 18 years of sales, sales experience leading our commercialization efforts. We're looking at raising two million. And we have an opportunity with the Canadian government's agricultural department for an additional one million in matching, so that helps um, that traction. But the key thing here is we want to use those funds towards our commercialization efforts. Right now, we manufacture our samples at a lab scale in the university, and we've hit that point in time where the purchase order quantities cannot be sustainably made in that faction. We want to engage with toll processors and we want to be able to scale. I want to end with purpose and profit. Um, we want to make profit, but there's a purpose behind this. As the temperatures increase globally because of climate change, last year, 2023, was the hottest year on record. This year is already happening. Um, farmers in India in particular are seeing huge decline in crop qu quality. And, and so our product, um, our solution takes dis um, uh, poor quality seed that is non, not suitable for human consumption and gives them an avenue to basically manufacture biopolyols from that because of uh, climate change challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for the presentation. It was really nice. Even though I couldn't get most of it, I'm not that pro uh, in your field. So I would love to know more about your business model. I know you tapped into it, but uh, if you walk us through how it works, I would appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, it's a B2B industry, mainly, right? You're chasing down whales, we've come to learn. Um, so it starts with really strong key partnership development. Um, when we look at the raw material suppliers, Bungie, you know, Cargill, they're huge players. So we started building relationship with them, but going a layer beneath that and forming relationships with the farmers, understanding, you know, what happened? Why does your crop this year high in uric acid? You're unable to sell that? Well, that's that's something we can use and working those relationships. So from from the supply chain, from input coming in all the way to the output. Um, in terms of sales and revenue, um, we've achieved this by 
um, developing relationships, sending product out, being part of accelerator programs, getting industry to validate the product and to build on that traction. Um, yeah, I could speak more, but I know there's lots of questions. Yes. Yeah, uh, you know, how do you compare the, you know, cost of, you know, uh, petroleum-based, you know, and the biofuel? Because I see more and more there is an increased demand for, you know, biodiesel, right? And it's being used as a blend, which again creates a lot of constraints on the supply of biofuels, and that pushes, pushes up the cost, right? I mean, so how does it compare with the petroleum-based, you know? Uh, and is it a hindrance for you, I mean, you know? Solid question. Um, so... We are a premium product, and we will always market ourselves in the premium space. Um, in terms of price comparison, we're about a 12 to 20 percent higher in in, in in sales price to petroleum polyols. The nice thing is that we present ourselves to Fortune 100 companies as not a nice to have, but a must have because of the regulatory pressures. We know that the industry is demanding for this and there's penalties in place. And so, um, you know, if castor seed um, production and competitive demands can only produce this much biopolyol, well, consider a formulation for canola and flax because it's a growing base, a co growing consumer demand. I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks. First and foremost, fascinating. It's, uh, it's hard to digest when you don't understand it, but um, the way you presented it and you started with the why, yes. that, that to me was spoke volumes, right? Like the, the, the actual inception of this. Question I have for you, and pardon my ignorance, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to understand, I mean, you, you kind of spoke to us about India and the bio oil industry over there and, and how they generate that through castor seed, right? You mentioned about chloral and flax seed in North America. I love that. Question I have is in terms of seasonality and how does it all work mm -hmm. in terms of, okay, you're using this, we have a short window, how are you able to, where is this being manufactured? How much is being manufactured? What is the demand? Yeah, absolutely fantastic question because I didn't have any insight into that space when we be began. Um, you know, the seed trading world is itself humongous. It's a, it's an FX. You know, it's 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 affected by currency. It's it's, but it's on a global scale. And so when the crop season is tailoring down, say in Canada, there are other markets where it's picking up. And so, um, you know, these suppliers, Bungie, Cargill, they leverage, um, you know, these trading um, timings um, to kind of provide to industry a non-interrupted um, source of, of, um, of the raw material. But it's it's quite complex, absolutely. Yeah. A side note: Are you a, a product of Nobelum? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> I'm nice. Not nice to hear that name here. But yes, I am. So, um, Cynthia, a great presentation. Really enjoyed that, and uh, loved you. None of it story. Um, so, if you were to win the prize money tonight, uh, over the next six months, what would you use it for? Great question. So right now, we are focused on um, approaching toll processing companies to um, basically um, assess their capability of commercializing and making our product on a larger scale. We've reached out and received um, their cost estimate for that assessment, about twenty to 30000 So we would apply this win towards achieving that, um, getting that package ready for them so that they could fulfill our, our large quantity orders. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Last but not least, we have a cease car from Voxel.
Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Aziz Kaur, and let me tell you something shocking. Did you know within the drug development industry today, there is a staggering 95% failure rate? We are talking about an industry that invests over 15 years and $3 billion annually, and these drugs still aren't reaching patients. See, it all starts in the lab, and then when it reaches humans, the results just aren't matching. All because we do not have an accurate platform to predict human behavior. Until now. Voxel has created the brand of bioprinted, human-like cancer tissue models that can identify the ineffective drugs much earlier in the drug development process. And to do so, we harness our 100% proprietary technology, starting with our high-resolution bioprinter, 600 times higher resolution than the standard, our trade software, that creates AI-optimized tissue models that can actually embed a human-like blood vessel system within our tissue models. Our universal bioink that can mimic the tissue properties of actual cancerous human tissue. And our custom perfusion device. So for the first time, pharmaceutical companies can directly inject their drugs through the blood vessels of our tissue models and identify the ineffective drugs much earlier on. Now the best part, with our drugs being utilized as a negative drug screening platform, we do not require any FDA approval, accelerating our timeline to commercialization. And there's no better time than the present for our technology to hit the market with the FDA Modernization Act of 2021, which actually encourages the alternatives to animal models being used out there within drug development. So for the first time ever, Voxel's technology is being recognized as a viable alternative. Voxel has invested over 100 hours talking to our car target customers, the pharmaceutical companies, to understand their needs for mass adoption. In, in this collaborative effort, it has led to us securing 10 paid pilot projects with these prominent drug developers. We plan to leverage the, su the success of these paid pilot projects and the success of our validation studies that are currently being conducted in-house and make our introduction to large pharma by 2025. And due to the nature of conducting all of the R&D in-house, our universal bioink has really become a product of its own. It can actually mimic the chemical and mechanical properties of cancerous human tissue. And another best part, it's universally uh, bioprinter compatible, meaning it's compatible with any bioprinting technology out there. You don't just have to use our printer, you can use anything that's out there. And we have a strong IP portfolio with multiple provisional patents and a trade secret software. To date, Voxel has raised 6.5 million in dilutive and non-dilutive capital. Oh. I apologize, I always speak in Canadian. <laughs> um, and currently, we've raised a 1.5 million round that's gotten oversubscribed. We're planning for our Series A in the upcoming year to complete the execution of our pilot projects alongside of our validation studies. And we project a $1 million revenue due to the sales of our Universal BioWinks and these paid pilot projects and we're fueled by a team of 15 full-time experts in hardware development, bioprinting, and tissue engineering, alongside of the support of our advisors in business development and oncology expertise. Voxel is female-led, and our mission here is very clear. That is to accelerate drug development and shape the future of drug development. Please join Voxel. Thank you so much, and I'm open to any questions. Yeah, are there any early evidences of false positives, you know, uh, drug which have been tested on your tissues and which would actually have been effective, but, you know, because of this, you know, it got 
you know, rejected? Oh, okay. That's a fantastic question. So let me tell you the current stage where Voxel is at, right? We're almost at our fourth year, come this August, actually. So for the past three years, Voxel has really spent our time developing the R&D of our product, right? So our bioprinter, our universal bioink, and our trade vascularization software. Currently, we're enlisting in our in-house stage one validation studies. So to answer your question, currently what we're doing is we're taking standard of care drugs so drugs that have already hit the market, right, they've surpassed clinical trials, and we're using it on our models. And we're showcasing how accurate is this compared to what's already been published in clinical trials. So to answer your question, we don't have the data yet, right? We're currently validating in-house. I'll tell you our plans for stage two. Now, this is really the critical stage, and that's why we really need to go into series A, right, before we make our introduction to large pharma. Now, stage two is where we're going to take drugs that have failed in clinical trials, but have surpassed preclinical studies, so in the lab stage, right, what they're currently doing, and showcasing that our technology, Voxel's technology, could have caught it faster. Uh, does anyone have a question? Can I go? Uh, great, great, great presentation. Um, my question was, um, first of all, this is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, but I'd love to understand, and maybe you already covered this and I missed it, but a little bit more about the key business model sure. for this. And you know, when it comes to development, there's also a lot of costs inclus included in it compared to the sales. So I just love to hear the business model sure. and how what your profit margins look like. Sure, yeah, that's fantastic. So currently we have two business models when it comes to the tissue models. So one is selling the tissue model as a consumable. And to explain this a bit further, um, it would be we would print the tissue model in house for the pharmaceutical company um, after obviously understanding their needs, right, the dimensions they need for the tissue model, capillary size, what type of cancer they're trying to simulate, what type of tumor microenvironment. We print the tissue models in house for you and then we would ship them out to your facility and you would do the drug screening there, right? But uh, our second business model, which is actually becoming the more prominent one, um, and has larger profit margins of upwards of 65% to 70% currently, is a service model. In the fact of, you ship your drugs to us, we'll print the models, and we'll do the initial screening for you. And the reason being why this actually isn't more capital intensive for us is when I'm talking about us conducting our validation studies, what does that mean? Well, we have to do the same screening in-house currently. We've already got the personnel, we've already got the technology, so let us take care of it for you, let's do it. And the reason why this is really attractive to those pharmaceutical SMEs out there and why they're preferring that business model, and we do believe that's the one we're gonna move forward with, is because they're smaller. They don't have the facility and the personnel to do a lot of this screening in-house, so let us help you. We've already developed the technology, we already have the equipment and personnel, we'll do it all for you and we'll give you the data to move forward. Very interesting presentation. And um, uh, could you tell me how you came up with this? How did this, uh, you say you started four years ago. So mm -hmm. how did this all begin? Yeah. And did I hear that you have patents? Yes, we yeah. do. Yeah, so we have multiple provisional patents signed. Um, actually, let me answer the first part of your question. I apologize. Like signed, done, deal? Patents or no, they're in the process okay. currently. Yeah, they're in the process currently. So to, I'll answer the patent question first since we're already on it. So for BioInks, we have two provisional patents. One on um, the materials we've had to synthesize um, to, to create them. The second is the overall process of developing the BioInks. The third and by far one of the most crucial patents we have, we recently got and filed, um, is for our bioprinter. And the software will remain a trade secret because as we all know out there, it's really hard to patent software. Um, and we're currently in the midst of uh, creating and filing the patents for our two, um, for our tissue models and two in that sense, right? Um, the reason because they haven't been complete yet is we're still embarking in our validation study. So we need to complete that before the patents. Um, now the first part of your question, right? How did Voxel really come to be? So um, I am actually not the founder of Voxel, but I've really joined Voxel 
Foxall's journey for the past two and a bit years now. Um, I was onboarded as one of the mechanical engineers, helped develop some of the proprietary technology, and now moved over to business development. But let me give you a little bit of a background of our founder, because unfortunately, she could not be here today. So our founder and CEO is Dr. Carolina Valente, um, and she originally resides from Brazil. So this is actually a very personal story for her. Um, one of her family members themselves was affected by breast cancer. Um, and I should actually put this out there is that the first cancer that we're really focusing on as a women-led company is breast cancer. Not because it's the most prominent cancer in females all over the world. It is the most prominent cancer out there. So it needs to get focused on, right? And she conducted her PhD. And while doing her PhD, focusing on breast cancer and bioprinting out there, what she came across realizing is there are not accessible, accurate enough testing platforms when it comes to drugs, to drug development out there. Um, and in doing so, she finished her PhD, and she has such a strong background in mechanical engineering, chemistry. She was like, I need to solve this, this problem. And not just by creating another bioprinter, by talking to the drug developers out there and realizing what their need, what are their needs. And they don't want another piece of hard tech. They want a screening platform. They want something accurate. And that's why for the past three years, all we've done is fulfill their wishes in creating the most customizable and accurate platform. Of course, thank you. Asis, great presentation. Thank you. And I could really sense your passion. Yeah. Uh, for a minute, I thought you were the founder. I so kudos that. to you on that. <laughs> um, my question is about um, potential challenges that mm -hmm. the company might be facing. I mean, you got me at no FDA approval. Yeah. That was fantastic. I'm yeah. like, that That really caught me. Right. But um, I, I want to understand, like, who are your competitors? Right. Are there any competitors? And uh, what do you see to be potential issues in this particular space sure. in the next year? Sure, uh, I love this. I love this question. I really, really do. So um, let me give you a little bit of background of our current uh, competitors. I'm going to put competitors in quote, and then I'm going to explain why. So right now, that's uh, spheroids and organoids. Um, to um, explain to the general public what I'm kind of talking about when I'm talking about spheroids and organoids, you can imagine you get your cancer cells, and you put them in the bio ink, and they're kind of this gel-like pudding, right? Okay. Um, how do we differ from that? What is Voxel doing that is our unique proposition, and we would do label it as being the first movers in the industry, is we're actually putting vasculature in there, a blood, blood vessels, right? We're actually recreating that tumor microenvironment. So the main things with our competitors and why we are the first movers, you're only able to analyze those models for 20 to, 24 hours to 72 hours, right? That's not sufficient. That's not even as long as the drugs are you know, residing with, inside our human body. Additionally, how are we ever going to be able to map how the drugs are diffusing in and out of the capillaries? It's not an accurate platform. And that's why it's leading to this 95% failure rate time and time again. So I'm not saying we have the best model out there. I'm just saying we have the best model out there to date. We're getting better. Right? We're starting with vasculature, but we're going to move on. We're developing more cells to integrate into our model. We're getting better. The step isn't to create the best model right off the top of our heads. Right, We're starting with version one, and then we'll build from there as a community. So I think I mostly answered your question. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong. OK, good. Of course. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Sorry, uh, I was just curious about the the business model uh -huh. of yours because yeah. you said that the seventy percent of the profit is coming from the in-house services that mm -hmm. you're offering. Does it any hurdle cause any hurdle in your scaling along the way? Have you thought about that? Everything p conducting everything in-house. Sorry, I, I missed a little bit. Um, in, in scalability, well. Actually, no, yes and no. There, there, there's obviously pros and cons, but let me give you the biggest pro, right? So when it comes to scalability, what do we really need? What's our largest constraint as a company? We're talking about throughput, right? How much can we really do? Um, when these pharmaceutical companies are screening their drugs, they need multiple, hundreds of models, right? Right now, we're constrained to one bioprinter in-house because it took us a while to create a high-resolution bioprinter. So currently, what Voxel is working on and our amazing hardware team um, is creating a 
production bioprinter. And we have the expertise and personnel to do so. So all we really require is capital coming from Series A to really just recreate another one of our printers. We've done the design work. We've done the R&D. Now it's, hey, let's order those components again, stick to the same plans we did before, and create another one, right? That's really our only constraint in scalability. And of course, personnel. But you can see the majority of our Series A funding is really going towards growth and scalability so, so we can meet the product demands of our upcoming partnership projects. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Asis. So here are our four superstars. And now you have the tough part. While the audience will enjoy something musical, we will take you to the dungeon <laughs> to work your numbers out and give us the winner. And while we do that, for audience, that's the QR code for you. That's where you can vote for your favorite pitch. And that favorite pitch takes away a cash prize today. It can be completely different from the judge's choice as well. So judges, we will take you to the dungeon, and I will bring you back. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, that's a difficult job. All of them were so good, so inspiring. What great entrepreneurs. Each sector they are in is unique. What they're doing is so innovative, amazing. And we at Thai are so, so thankful that we got to work with great founders, listen to these pitches, their passion, their determination. You all are winners. You are entrepreneurs. There is always ups and downs. But what you're doing are amazing. You all are inspiration to the next generation of entrepreneurs in this room. Thank you so much for what you do. While judges, you are in the dungeon making the decision. Uh, other people, you have a little bit fun time with us right now. While our amazing musicians get ready to perform some live music for you, and Neha takes the judges out, uh, some housekeeping. We have to be out of this place by 9 o'clock, OK? Come what may, pick up your stuff by 8.50, 8.55. We have to leave. RBC people are too generous, but not after 9 PM, OK? That's one. Uh, so. We will still have presentation, which will wrap up in five minutes. So get your hands ready for all the big claps for the winners, presenters, and judges. But before that, I have with me a gorgeous Bridget O'Regan and Jordo Arnett. If I crucified your name, you can tell me. OK, close. Good. And people crucify my name, Apsana Upesana, so I should have that opportunity sometimes. But definitely let me know about the pronunciation later. And. Both of them have been captivating audiences as a duo for six years, but each of them has a professional solo career spanning around 40 years combined. Guys, which anti-aging drug you take? While neither of these musicians attended university for their craft. Ah, we get it. You are your inborn geniuses. I have one at home, too. And their entrepreneurial drive has them performing from crowd outside Blue Jay games to performing inside actual Rogers Center on game days. Bridget has been playing stadium shows for the WWE. You have to check her Instagram for that. It's absolutely how she dresses and how she captivates the audience there. I will ask the doors to be open so people can hear the music and join us in at this time. So they should get vocal rest too. Everybody chatting outside. Burna Boys and SB Bala Subramaniam. So here. The Canadian multiculturalism. Bridget has been performing a lot of Bollywood music. Guys, give a big round of applause. She does perform SB Bala Subramaniam music. See, at least I can pronounce that correctly. Again, sorry I crucified your name. While you need to tell me your name. How do I pronounce it? Oh, it's just Jordo Arna. I was just screwing up your video. Okay, perfect. Jordo. Oh my God, I was correct, it's Jodo only. Well, Jodo has been known to captivate audiences with his energy across Canada and Mexico. You can find both of them wowing crowds in packed Toronto venue most of the days of the week. And today, they are here to wow all of you with their enchanting music. And hence, I present to you, add some sparkle to the evening, I would request all of you who don't have, have empty glasses, go get some wine now. This is the time you're going to totally unwind yourself, energize yourself while you head back. 
on those busy highways and roads, and some of you are taking flights out too. So please get your glass filled up. This is the fun time, and that's how we roll at Thai Toronto. Great. So how much time do you need more? Uh, five minutes, if that. Sure. All the awesome, handsome men outside. Can you hear all the handsome men? Can you please join me inside for a beautiful woman and a very handsome man who's going to perform some live music for you who have struggled their way to the busy Toronto streets. You know how bad is the traffic. <laughs> we offered them helicopters, but they preferred subway because they thought that was better and less carbon emissions. I really sustainable music practices. I appreciate that for you. So all the people... Let's get your vocal cords some rest. Join us inside some for some enthralling music to call it a night. Those who are interested to carry on, 111 is having an after party that goes till 11 o'clock. They are at capacity, so you might not be able to enter. They have 500 people registered, but if you still have the energy to take your party animal to the next level, we have 111 open for you. And those who haven't taken used our media wall, they should take their pictures as well. Because who knows, you might be on the next Forbes with Thai Toronto. Am I right, Mahendra? Awesome. Great. Ready, Bridget? You start. Uh, I, I'm not on yet. OK, who has to on you? <laughs> OK, while they're putting their music thing together, do you want to say a few words in the meantime? I didn't do this electrical courses, otherwise I would have known how much time it takes to put all the wires together, but I think so you guys are working pretty efficiently at this time. Oh my God. You should have seen the pitch competition. I should have timer on for you. We did that for some of the founders, but they did amazing under pressure, most of the women founders. And to all the women superstar founders and innovators here, you have done amazingly well in your pitches. If you want to let your hair down, Take your shoes off and dance to the tune of these two amazing people. Floor is all yours because we are already in awe of you. Of all of you. Okay? Are we in air? The, and in the meantime, while the musicians are getting ready, all the handsome men and the beautiful, gorgeous women who were outside, if you haven't scanned the QR code and given your vote for the pitching, if you were here and you heard in some of those pitches, please scan the QR code, use the power of phone in your hand, and vote for your favorite company, idea, product, innovation. Go ahead. You have the last chance. Uh, we just came to know that the bar is closed right now. They wanted you to be pretty sober listening to the music. Hats off to RBC. Thank you so much. Because in the end, they want you to know there is a banking decorum and rules applicable here too.
only feel your mind goes in the shot it out It's my life, it is now over I ain't gonna let it Oh, 
Cheers. We went over by a couple of minutes, but cheers. Thank you. This is Bridget. I'm Jordo. See ya. <laughs> We have the results here from the judges. So we're gonna announce the winners. I would request all the four amazing women founders and the judges to enter here with us. Oh, Suwendu, can you do me a favor? There's a gift for Hitesh and the certificate. Can you just get him this gift? He's leaving. Sean, can you please give Hitesh's gift to Suwendu? Hitesh is leaving, he has a flight from Montreal. And if you can find his certificate, at least get the gift to him. Certificate to Wendu will put it in his office. Yes. I would request all the founders and judges to join us on the stage. We are really running short of time, so I would request all the four founders and the judges to join us on the stage, please. If I can get Jacqueline, Zizi, Susanna, It's going to be a big powerhouse. I hope the stage can take all the excitement. And thank you, Bridget and Jordo, for an amazing performance. You brought the much-needed energizing and refreshment that we all needed. Thank you for the amazing, amazing music. Thank you so much. Big round of applause for our musicians, please. Thank you so much. So do I have all the judges on the stage or we are missing people here? Disha, Jacqueline, Susanna, please come on the stage. I would also like Suwendu, if you can join us on the stage on behalf of ICICI Bank. Do we have David here from RBCX? I know it's a late night, people are tired. Do we have anybody from Bayless MedTech? Mahendra, can you please join us on the stage? 
And Vijay, please join us on the stage. Neha, can you bring the results on? So I do have the winner for the Audience Choice Awards. Before we go to the judges, it was a very, very tight competition. The winner has just won it by tiny margin, but win is always a win, and you all are neck to neck. The winner for the Audience Choice Awards is Voxel. So winner tonight will be getting $1,500 in cash prize, and we'll get the check to you. Mahindra went to the bank. Bank was closed, and RBC said, our, our ATM doesn't work after 9 p.m. So surely we'll get that to you. Go ahead. And now we have the award for the judges. It was a hard one, but that's what's happening. All of them were really great. All of them, we had very, very great feedback for, for all of them as well. But the judges decided that the one who's going to India for the grand finale of Thai Women Global Competition is Cynthia Ann from Nunafab. <laughs> Congratulations, Cynthia. So can we facilitate, well, there is certificates there too. I need a big round of applause for, I need a big round of applause for the winners and all the women entrepreneurs and the judges for putting all the efforts today. So if you can come one by one ahead, all the founders, we have certificates for you and a small token of thanks. Assis from Waxel, thank you so much. Can I have Lisa, Lisa next? Here you go, Vijay. Thank you. Who's this one? Jacqueline. ZZ. Thank you. You have to come on. This is Pounder. Pounder Naver. You should, Sophia, you need to um, take a snap to that social media. How many had on the fifth picture? What's this? Who's this? Who is left? Zizi? Come on. Okay. You know the, 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 the best part, the smaller one can go in the
Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It has been a fantabulous evening, but we couldn't have done this without your support for Thai Toronto. Thank you so much for your support. A big round of applause for all our sponsors, which includes Bayless Medical Tech, City of Toronto, RBC, and ICICI Bank Canada. A big round of applause for our sponsors, our community partners, including Outpost, Community Tech, Toronto Inc. And a big round of applause for Susanna Vaz, who, in spite of having a super busy schedule with Collision, gave her entire evening to us. Thank you for your support and City of Toronto's support. Thank you. And in the end, a big round of applause for all of you. Can you please take a moment and give an applause for yourself? Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great evening and see you all next year. Thank you. Last but not the least, a big round of applause for our media partner, Nisarg Media. Thank you for making it all happen, bringing it all together for us always. Thank you to the musician and thank you for the RBC team for managing everything for us till the end. Thank you, everyone. Bye and have a good night. Safe travels.